All right, Yuckmouth, how's it going? Man, good to be here, man. Thanks for having me, Cam Capone, man. I've been, you know, I'm a fan of your shit, man, period. No disrespect, but yo, your interviews be so deep and so dope, you know what I mean? And you do like dope content that a lot of people don't do. A lot of people just sit in front of their computer at home, in front of their iPad or they, you know what I mean, phone. You really go out there and do your due diligence. You get the top people, you know what I mean, from all walks of life. So definitely, I'm a fan of your shit, man, period. Well, thank you, man. Thank you, man. I, you know, same here. You know what I'm saying? I've been, I've been listening to you for, you know, since I got five on it. Uh oh <laughs> Thank you, sir. You know? So, yeah, man. Uh, well, let's get into it. You're from East Oakland. Yes, East Oakland, man, the Ville. You know what I mean? Six five Ville. Um, but it's two projects connected. It's one uh, one uh, neighborhood, so 69th and the 65th. But um, I'm from the 65, 65th, 6500 block. And um, yeah, East Oakland, man. Born and raised. Um, yeah, and and just all the drama. You know what I mean? Projects. Uh, you know, struggling. You know what I mean? Welfare, Section 8, food stamps. You know what I mean? Living family to family, home to home. You know what I mean? It takes a village to raise me. You know what I mean? So. You live with your grandma, you live with your uncle, you live with your sister, your auntie, everybody, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it happens in, you know what I mean, the projects, the ghetto, you know what I mean, in all walks of life, you know what I mean? Not just Oakland, but, yeah, it, it took the family to raise me, period. And, you know, that's what, what happened in the streets, you know what I mean? Okay, so you had a lot of people around you that were that supported you, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, it happens, you know what I mean? Like, when you got your mom battling alcoholism, you got your dad in and out of jail, you know what I mean, from doing his street shit, you know what I mean? Everybody got to step up, you know what I mean? Just shout out to the grandmas, you know what I mean? The grandma always held us down. Like, even the, the uncles that got out of pocket and, and fell off, you know what I mean? They fresh out of jail, they could always go to their mama house, which was my grandma, you know what I mean? Same with the grandkids, you know what I mean? The auntie or the daughter that can't take care of her kid, the, the mama will, which is the grandma, you know what I mean? So thank God for them grandmothers that raised us and uh, showed us that love when, when uh, the moms couldn't do it or the dad couldn't do it, you know? Man, that's what's up. That's what's up, man. Well, uh, you know, what were you like in high school? Ah, shit, man. Um, junior high school, um, that's when um, I got to the money. I was um, out hustling, you know what I mean? So. Um, yeah, I was a fly guy in junior high school, man. Um, still drawn. I was a cartoonist, drawn and shit. Um, still loving to do music, you know what I mean? I used to play the drums, the, the bass drum and the, the snare drum and uh, the trumpet. But I wasn't doing rap, like super rap, you know what I mean, until I met Numb in junior high school, and that's when I started really rapping. Was he from your same area too? Nah, he ain't from my area. He's from a different part of Oakland, but um, um we went to the school when I moved with my uncle and my sister, it was by Lake Merritt. So Lake Merritt had a school called West Lake. You know what I mean? And we all went there. Numb, me, um, Kevin Choice, which, you know, become like one of the dopest pianists in the game, playing for everybody, like doing concerts and tours and, you know, big shit. So um the uh, the Who Riders, Chop Black and um uh, Mr uh Mr um Mr. Taylor, they was in school with us. So it's a lot of rap groups that came oh Rap and Run, can't forget Rap and Run, the legendary Rap and Run went to our junior high school. So it was a lot of dope ass rappers in our junior high school and we used to rap at lunchtime, had a little baby talent shows, like literally every fucking lunchtime, man. Yeah, that that was the move. So yeah, Westlake Junior High, you know what I mean? A lot of people came from there. That's that that was solidified in um, the industry from the Bay Area. And high school? Junior high. This what is like the eighth grade, seventh, eighth, ninth grade. This is junior high. And what was going on in high school? High school is when we're chasing the hieroglyphics. <laughs> 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 like, yeah, like they, they, um, they came out, 93 till, and they were young. You know what I mean? We knew what high school they went to. They went to a prestigious high school in Oakland called Skyline. That's where all the rich people live in the hills and shit. That's like Beverly Hills or something. So you had to have money to go to that school. So they all went to the rich prestigious school. And uh, yeah, we will fucking cut school and catch the bus for their lunchtime to try to find these motherfuckers and battle because when you battle a motherfucker, you make your name in the streets. You know what I mean? So we trying to battle and make our name in the streets, you know what I mean? Find the hieroglyphics. We down to, um, in Berkeley. 
it was um, this area on Telegraph by Blondie's, you know what I mean, by the Blondie's Pizza, and everybody from the Bay Area, we just come over there, you have freestyle ciphers and shit, so we just trying to make a name, you know what I mean, me and them, you know what I mean, just trying to make a name in the game at that time, so um, we both in the streets, you know, really hustling, you know what I mean, doing our thing, so that's the, the main thing, the main component, you know what I mean, really hustling, but um, hustling led to me going to jail, you know what I mean? And that jail term led to, it was the beginning of the loonies. You know what I mean? Period. You got too much time to think. Um, I had a year in juvenile, in uh, Los Aros camp. And that was just like junior high school. It was another just a rap fucking alumni type of situation. We had a uh, demo, you know, from the Get Low Players, uh, JT, the bigger figure, one of his artists, he was locked up with me. And uh, when you're in camp, you get to go home on the weekends. You know what I mean? Like when you get later into your sentence, you know what I mean? You get to go home. When you start your sentence, you don't. So I was just there on the beginning. So Demo would get to go home every weekend. He'd come back and he'd come back with all the latest raps, all the latest clothes, all this shit. You know what I mean? So he had the song called Cancer Stick. It was about not smoking cigarettes. It was a positive song. And um, they had this motherfucker doing like a tour in juvenile hall. Like going from pod to pod, camp to camp, unit to unit, singing this positive song about not smoking cigarettes called Cancer Stick. Huge. Everybody knew it word for word. And I'm like, okay, I rap too. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, you know, I hustled, you know, definitely, but I know how to do what he's doing. So, you know, from what me and Numb and it was doing in junior high school and shit. So I'm like, okay, let me put the pen to the pad. And um, that's when I wrote the Ice Cream Man. You know what I mean? I'm saying all that to say this because that same song that I wrote in Juvenile is a song that will get us our record deal, me and them our record deal. So I write that song. Um, I come with the whole the whole group name. You know what I mean? Me and them, them had a group called Brothers With Potential. That was our group in junior high school. His name was The, the Skinny One. My name was E. Flo. So when I was in uh, camp, I'm like, okay, I want to come with a different group. You know what I mean? Let's come with a group called the Looney Tunes. And we're going to be the wacko, crazy gangster side of hip hop. You know, funny, you know what I mean? Comedy, but still street shit. Came with the condom man, you know, drew this. You know what I mean? This is a motherfucker. I drew this too, but drew the piece. You know what I mean? Uh, drew the condom man, drew the logo, the font and all that. And um, started writing songs. So when I got out, I approached Numb with the idea like, yo, um, I came with an idea, let's call the group the Looney Tunes, you know what I mean? I'm Yuck Mouth, I got the crazy ass mouth. Your name gonna be Numbskull, you, you crazy your brain, you know what I mean? Crazy ass, you know what I mean? You're a numbskull, you're the knucklehead, you know what I mean? You don't give a fuck. With a crazy mouth and knucklehead, we loony, you know what I mean? It's the skull, you know what I mean? So, um, gave him that approach and sung the Ice Cream Man to him, you know what I mean? He loved it, and he was like, yeah, let's do it, you know what I mean? So. Um, it didn't just happen overnight. We were still in the streets doing our thing. And the street, being in the streets is what led to us getting our deal. It was a, um, we basically, long story short, we turned the dope deal into a record deal. You know what I mean? So um, it was a drought. Me and them, we, we pitched in some money to go get some work. And um, we had to trap with the dude that's giving us the work. And we ran it up or whatever, cashing out. And at the trap is a dude that fucking be in two short videos. We like, oh, that's Baby Jesus. And we like, yo, Baby Jesus. He like, yeah, man, what's up? We like, you know Too Short? He like, yeah, that's my nigga. We like, man, fuck all this, we rap. <laughs> nigga, uh, we really rap. You know, tell niggas hypey, man, we rap, nigga. What you talking about? Fuck all this, we rap. He like, all right, my nigga, bust something. So none been having nothing written right then. So I, I get up and bust the ice cream, man. And um, after that, he was like, yo, man, um, I got my own record label, C No Records. Um, I got an artist named Drew Down. And um, I want y'all to come to the studio tonight, um, tomorrow and, and come meet up with Drew Down. And, um, yeah, let's see if y'all vibe and click. So um, we went to the studio the next day. And that's where I had the uh, legendary uh, battle with Rap and Run. You know what I mean? A dude from our junior high school. Now he signed the Too Short at this time with a group called Bad Influence, him and uh, Aunt Dilly. You know what I mean? So they kicking up dust and Ron is on a fucking steroid level at this time. I'm not knowing. 
Cause that when we was in junior high school, me and Rap and Ron wasn't the dope niggas. It was like Numb and all the other niggas. They was the dope. They took this shit serious. We wasn't dope like that. Me and Rap and Ron definitely wasn't the dope, dopest niggas. But we was rapping. And I'm thinking like, if this that nigga that was still in junior high school, I got him. I got him, cause I'm hella dope right now. And it, I know he looking at me like, oh, not the wackest nigga in the group. I'm gonna kill this nigga. So, <laughs> so um, it's a three, it's a three on one. You know what I mean? It's rapping around and Dilly Dog, and it, it's a uh, Eclipse, who I later found out found out was my cousin through marriage. You know what I mean? Later on in life, but um, I'm battling three dudes. So, take out E, take out Aunt Dilly, and it's just me and rapping around going back to back. Um, rapper Ron is a master freestyler. You know what I mean? Like back then we were saying riddance. You know what I mean? Written, written rap. So we all going back to back with riddance. Rapper Ron was rapping about everything in the fucking room. So we got guitars and shit. Yo, woo, woo. Shorty B playing the guitar. Aunt Banks on the move. Like he naming all the people. Spice One got the, like all the motherfuckers that's in the room. He naming them and naming the clothes they got on and this, that, and the third. And the whole battle was whoever lost. Got to buy some pizza for the whole studio. So rapper Ron ends it with a line like, "Yeah, man, CNA's man, go roll some more reefer. Matter of fact, you lost. Go buy some motherfucking pizza." Everybody, like, ah! Because <laughs> the bet was about the fucking pizza. You know what I mean? Some motherfuckers went crazy. I, <laughs> so I lost. <laughs> so everybody seen that, and I just say the ice cream man. I was saving that because I knew that song was so dope that somebody would have stole it. I'm in here with the peers. The, these dudes are signed. I'm at Dangerous Studios at the at the shit in West Oakland. Too Short at a West Oakland studio where they do all they shit, two-story joint. I'm there. It's Too Short, Ant Banks, Shorty B, all the, everybody, all the rappers, everybody there. Rich, everybody's there. Richie Rich. All these Spice people are one. there. Spice, everybody's there. And so I'm all like, them watched you battle? All, all of them are there. Everybody's here. So I'm like, I can't bust that ice cream, man. If I do, somebody's going to steal it. Mm. And sure enough, it wasn't the people in the room. It ended up being somebody else that we'll talk about later on. But yeah, man, um, after that, um, we recorded the Ice Cream Man for Drew Down album. He loved us. You know what I mean? Drew Down accepted us as brothers. Um, we made the video. The video was the first viral moment in hip hop, I think, like gangster hip hop, like Bay Area gangster hip hop, because not only did we do the Ice Cream Man video, CNH, y'all gotta give the props to the uh, executive producer, He's a, he was a, a vivid car collector, you know what I mean? So he had all the fucking decked out cars, he went trophies and shit for all his cars, being candy painted, nice interior, triple gold Danes and Vogues and all types of shit. So he was winning hella car trophies with his cars and shit. You know what I mean? So um, him being the, the car collector dude, he like, okay, we gonna have the ice cream truck in the video. But fuck that, we gonna put the ice cream truck on triple gold dates and bones, you know what I mean? Whoa, 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 whoa. So we like, okay, shit, whatever. That motherfucker pulled up with a brand new Coke white ice cream truck on triple gold dates and bones for the video shoot. Like, yeah, this is what we doing. First time ever seen on the planet. The first time a motherfucker seen them rims on a fucking ice cream. Rims on the ice cream truck, period. So um, this is 92, 90, no, 93. This 93. So we do the video shoot, you know, we, we putting on, like everybody in Oakland showed up. Like it was, it was a video where everybody was just together. Like Oakland was proud of this moment. You know what I mean? Cause you got the Ville, you know what I mean? Which is me, my niggas. You got Drew Downey from the 50s and, and CNH, he from the 50s and tap in with the Ville. It was just so much street shit tied in with, with us. You know what I mean? So many cloths and so many avenues and streets that we brought out damn near the whole East Oakland when we did that video shoot. And it was legendary, so legendary that, you know, a year or two later, you know, you get um, Friday and you get Big Worm mm -hmm. riding an ice cream truck with a perm, like our executive producer, with the triple gold dates, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. they clown it. But we was the first to do it in the actual video shoot. So we made waves to where LA recognized, you know what I mean? And um, we got a deal after that. Drew Down got the deal. He got signed to Relativity. And um, they was looking for the next the next people, you know what I mean? So um, they signed us, they signed Mac Maul, they signed Richie Rich, they signed Three Times Crazy. Everybody in the base started getting signed, you know what I mean, period. Everybody started getting signed. It was like, you know, a gold rush towards the Bay Area. 
you know what was that transition like from because you said you were in the streets and then you started doing music more what was that transition like for you um basically um i stopped selling crack and then you know just um like you can't get you know and like start selling weed so i was selling weed and shit at studios and shit i was a dude that was against drugs like nigga, y'all smoking weed, y'all gonna be my next customer for the crack and so on, so on. So I was against all that shit. So I was always taught not to get high off your own supply. So once we start rapping, smoking weed and shit became a part of the culture. You know what I mean? So I was selling weed to all the niggas in the studio, period. I was on tour selling weed to Biggie, Faith, Naughty by Nature, everybody when we went on that tour. So um, I was still on the street mentality, you know what I mean? But after I came off that tour, we made so much money. Um, we had opportunities with so many soundtracks, and we did a song with Quincy Jones, got cashed out big time for it, That the song that we got Grammy nominated for. It was like, you can't keep a foot in the street and, you know what I mean, do this rap shit. So I let it all go, you know what I mean, period. Let that shit go. Was there any bad situations you had when you were selling drugs and doing it in the streets? Um, you take losses, of course. You you take losses and shit. That that happens with the game. Um, um, one situation that happened when I got shot up on my own block. You know what I mean? Period. By I got checked. You know what I mean? It was a a, a demonstration for me doing some shit out of pocket. So um, it happens. Some shit like that happens sometimes. You know what I mean? Motherfuckers come through the block, shoot shit up. Somebody gets shot. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, you go through they shit, shoot shit up, somebody get shot. So, yeah, it was a lot of demo tapes and shit. Um, Where'd you get shot at? I got shot. I ain't gonna tell you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> embarrassing spot. <laughs> embarrassing spot, okay. Embarrassing, man. But, uh, yeah, I survived. That's all I know. I, I mean, survived. Was it like a... Was it like a drive-by or was nah, it like Nah, hell no. Nah. I was getting disciplined, man. I was getting disciplined. I did some out-of-pocket shit, you know what I mean, to one of the OGs of my neighborhood, and he sick the, the young hyenas on me. You know, my homies, my crew. Now, I mean, my crew had to discipline me. And, um, yeah, it, it got ugly. You know what I mean? It went from... They didn't try to jump you first? Usually yeah. a discipline is a jumping. I got jumped, but I survived the jump. The jump didn't work. Then I had to do the 101. The 101 didn't work. I won that. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm walking off. And they're like, no, you're not done. <laughs> they got the mm -hmm. popping at me. So, yeah, so that's how that happened, man. But I outdid all that. And then mm -hmm. I was still standing. So they came with some pistols on me. I mean, one dude came with a pistol on me, you know what I mean? We could have kept fighting. It didn't even need all that, you know what I mean? But it happens in the streets, you know what I mean, period. And um, when you do out-of-pocket shit, you get checked. So um, I'm not saying that you have to get shot, but you need to be disciplined. So I wish that was still around when, you know what I mean, you got these young dudes in the rap game right now, just full kamikaze. They do what the fuck they want to do. And there's no repercussions, nobody checking them, nobody disciplining them, or none of that shit. So we got disciplined and we knew what not to do, period. Even if it came with me getting shot, I knew not to do that shit again, period. These how, kids how bad was it? Huh? How bad was the I had a flesh wound? wound. I had a flesh wound. Oh, okay. Bullet's still in me. I had a flesh wound, man. Bullet's so still in shot. you? I got shot in the muscle. Can you feel it? Can you nah, still feel nah. it in your I, muscle? I didn't feel it when I got shot. You didn't feel it yet? I, I interviewed uh, Little Reese out of Chicago. I don't know if you know. Yeah, yeah. But he, he got shot in the neck. Right. What did it feel like when that bullet first hit you? What were you thinking? I didn't even realize I was shot. I just, like, felt rips coming through the car, but I didn't realize I was hit until I got out the car and went to another person's car, like, asking for help. They was, like, looking at me, like, scared and shit. Like, what the fuck? Like, something was wrong. They was looking at me like something was wrong, so I knew something was wrong at the time. I'm like, damn. And I just felt my neck, and I felt blood I, coming from my neck. I just put my thing over my shit, like, and just let them take me to the hospital. And he was telling me that, like, when he got shot, like, he didn't even realize he was shot at first. It yeah, because so, so much fast. adrenaline. The adrenaline is pumping, you know what I mean? So when I got shot, it felt like a charley horse. Like, somebody just socked me real hard. You know what I mean? Like, how you get a charley horse when you get shot. It was like that, and I just kept running. Like, I didn't even feel it. And then I lay down in the bed, and uh, my grandma, I'm living with my grandma at the time, she like, you know, come and check on me, turn on the light, and the whole bed is bloody red. And she like, oh my God! And she called the ambulance. That's when I noticed I'm shot. I ain't even noticed. Like, literally, until I lay down, and the whole bed is bloody. Yeah, I ain't even noticed, man, so. <clears throat> wow. I thought, like, I sprung something or cracked something when I, 
you know what I mean, was running. I thought like, oh, I must have sprung something. Like, uh, you know what I mean? I'm running too fast. I didn't feel it. So, yeah, but um, I ain't saying people need to be shot, but they need to be checked when they doing disrespectful shit. You know what I mean? Period. I ain't need to be shot. I could have been jumped or whatever, but when kids doing disrespectful shit and getting out of line and, um, you know what I mean? Yeah, somebody got to check them. So I got checked. You know what I mean? I ain't perfect, you know? Shit happens. <laughs> Being a youngster, yeah, no, you gotta bump your head to learn how to ride the bike, right? No, real shit, man. Straight up, so I mean, shit happens in these streets, man. If you're a part of it, you know what I mean? You can't escape it. You know, you can't just be part of the money side. Like, I'm making money and I'm splurging. No, it's a deadly side that come with a jail, prison, you know what I mean? Funk with other territories and shit that's trying to get what you got. You know what I mean? People trying to come to your turf and grind and make money, like, it, that's fault. that's pistol play. You know what I mean? Prison, juvenile, all the shit. You know what I mean? Gun, shootouts, stabbings. You know what I mean? Dolphins trying to rob you and shit. Get over on you. BGF motherfuckers getting out of jail, buffing shit, heroin addicts. They coming and choking motherfuckers out, taking their sacks. The little young 15, 14, 15 year old, man, give me your money. I'll beat your ass. You know what I mean? That type of shit. They coming through and terrorizing too, the old folks. So. Just being a part of that type of lifestyle um, just makes you a different type of individual than um, a lot of people that's, you know what I mean, not part of that lifestyle. Like, you got people that, that really come from good good homes, you know what I mean, family, good families. Uh, they got the mom and parents in the house. They in a good area, you know, good school and private school, shit like that. Nah, I'm from the free lunch line and the welfare line, man. Period. With the Black Panthers took care of the neighborhood, you know what I mean? Gave us the free lunch programs and the recreation centers, you know what I mean? Where um, the streets had to raise the kids because the father wasn't there, the mother wasn't there. So that's me, a product of that. So yeah, um, it, it made me who I am. I don't regret none of this shit, period. I'd, I'd rather be raised how I was raised and raised as a square pool bear. Because when I, when I do my art, when I rap, I have something to talk about. I have a life that I live that people make movies about. Like one, one day of my life will be like paid in full. Literally, like just one day. Not talking about all the days and all the crazy shit that happened for us gangster shit. So if I got a paid in full movie in one, one day, one, one episode that happened with me when I was young could be like compared to the whole paid in full movie. So if I got that and I can't make movies and I know how to rap, I'm gonna paint these pictures with my rap. So when I rap, I go in there doing my storytelling about me, my life, you know what I mean? Period, past shit, you know what I mean? That I did back then that people, you know, make movies about and make serious, it's like Snowfall and shit. You know what I mean? I, I was out there when crack got first made. You know what I mean? My uncles and them, all that, like you know, my lineage was out there, part of that type of shit. So when I got that type of, connection when growing up and they making movies about this shit I could rap about it and give that same dialogue you know what I mean so that's all I'm doing rapping about you know shit that I've been through dangerous shit you know what I mean that I'm lucky to be here to talk about you know what I mean um serious shit you know what I mean that um only a, a, a certain few a chosen few could talk about you know what I mean not everybody you know so not only the, the not just to brag or boast about that lifestyle, but to tell people that don't want that lifestyle, like, this is it. Do you want it or not? You know what I mean? If you're getting this type of lifestyle, it's prison, death, you're getting shot, stabbed, robbed, all that shit. But on the other side, you get some money. It comes with money. <laughs> but is making that little bit of money worth risking and going to jail for fucking football numbers, risking your life, is it worth it? So. That's on the listener to decide when he hear the music, like, damn, that's cool, he went through that, but do I wanna go through that to make this street money? So I give them an option, you know what I mean? Like, people say, oh, case of music is negative. No, the average white boy ain't never went to the neighborhood. You know what I mean? The average Asian guy probably ain't never been to the block, I never, you know what I mean? So when Ice Cube talking this shit and Easy e talking they shit, I never knew about gangbang culture until I listened to them type of dudes. Okay, we seen colors, but I didn't know the particulars until I start listening to gangster rap, and they told me the protocols with certain gangs. You know what I mean? And um, boom, same with you listening to, 
too short. He told you about the protocol of uh, how this big pimping and macking in the Bay Area back in the day. You know what I mean? So rapping gives you, um, or rappers give you a demographic of, of what they going through in their neighborhood and what they shit is like. And the listener is either learning history, you know what I mean, or learning what, what to do or what not to do, you know what I mean, or just entertained by it. You know what I mean? Period. You know, so I learned a lot by listening to gangster rap. Period. What hats not to wear? You go to Chicago, can't wear your hat. Like I learned that from listening to rap. I didn't have to go to Chicago and have my hat to the side and get my brain blown off. You know what I mean? Um, I learned about certain areas. You know what I mean? Uh, how to survive in South Central. You know what I mean? With Ice Cube, a place where a pack of the gat is fundamental first. You don't learn the shit in the handbook. Here's a close look at a rap crook. Rule number one, get your ass a gun, a nine in your ass a beef, like shit like that, let you know, like this ain't all palm trees in Hollywood, nigga. When I land on the, I gotta get a nine, or my ass gonna be fine. This is, <laughs> this in the 80s, <laughs> in the 90s, bro, so. Yeah, like too short doing the ghetto talking about like you know East Oakland dope fiend chopping the pipe in the mouth, dope fiend die with a pipe in the like you know when you come to Oakland you gonna see that type of shit is giving you a vivid fucking uh, uh like a movie but it's on lyrics it's giving you a vivid vision of what this dude is going through or what his neighborhood is and and, and they struggle so it's a testimony. You know what I mean? It's like we the motherfucking commentators of the neighborhood. It's like when, when they get on ESPN and they get on these sport channels, the ex, you know what I mean, um, the ex ball players and shit. You know what I mean? They talk they shit about the game because they know the game. We the commentators of the street. You know what I mean? I retired from the street like the retired ball player and they live to talk about this shit. Same with us, man. We the commentators of the street and we live to talk about this shit. We should write books. <laughs> straight up but we do it musically and it's dope and, it, and it's accepted by everybody you know so yeah salute the gangster rap as much as people hate it you know yeah definitely man i grew up you know on gangster rap my era of music is death row you know right. uh, biggie death row you know the death whoa. row area you mentioned you went on tour with biggie yeah yeah definitely man um that was our first big tour you know, shout out to Al Heyman, man. Al Heyman was doing tours back then. So that was the first time I like, yo, me being a young dude from the block, I cussed Al Heyman out on the phone, literally. Like, the, I ain't gonna tell you what they offered us, but I was like, yo, we getting like triple that. Just doing, you know what I mean? Just, just book dates. You, know, you got us on a tour for 50 dates and we're getting, I, I can't roll with that. And it's like, ah, oh, man, this is woo, woo, woo. Like, Al Heyman had to bust it down to me, the, the significance of this tour. And I was like, okay, cool, let's do it. You know what I mean? But that's how much of a street dude I was. If it didn't make sense with the money, why why do it? You know what I mean? We here, if I'm getting more money over here, why do it for less? You know what I mean? But he said, hey, man, back to back to back to back. You're gonna have about two days off. It's every day you're gonna be getting that. Every other day, every day you're gonna be getting that. Besides two days of, two days of the week. Now you probably booked two days of the whole fucking week, or probably three days. You're gonna be booked five to six days a week compared to your two dates on your weekend that you're getting that full price or your one date on the weekend. What adds up? What you talking about? So, um, end up getting on tour with Al Heyman. I mean, uh, Al Heyman and Biggie Smalls. It was the um, the BT Teen Summit tour. So, um, Biggie Smalls, Jodeci, Mary J. Blige, Faith Evans, Junior Mafia, Little Kim, Naughty by Nature, uh, Missy Elliott, Timberland. They was opening acts at that time. They wasn't even Missy Elliott and Timberland. Um, uh, uh, Adina Howard, and who else is on with us? Um, it's like I'm missing somebody. I said Jodeci, right? I yeah, think jo so. and Jodeci. So yeah, we on tour. We we going ham. You know what I mean? Period. Instantly, my my first few days on the tour. You know what I mean? We being from the Bay back then, they knew we had weed. And this so, was right after I got five on it came out, right? This is like five on it comes out Fourth of July. You know what I mean? I mean uh. I race back on what comes out on 4th of July. Five on to come out in J June. We go platinum within a month. By Before the album came out, I think. Before the album even dropped, we was on tour with Biggie and them. I think we went in July. 
or June. Start. I think it was June or nah, cause we were still doing the remix and shit. I think I want to say it was June, July, and we was on that motherfucker a month and got kicked off that bitch. Period. For shit that other people was doing. We was the opening acts. With a, it was us, Adina Howard, Missy, and them was before Adina Howard. So they had some type of groups. That was a, a Devontae Swain artist. So Missy, Timberland, and they had some, some type of techno matrix looking shit with all the leather and shit. So they was some type of group. They was killing it. And then Adina Howard come on, then we come on. So on tour, it's a rule. Nobody come on stage with liquor. You know what I mean? Because if you spill it, you know what I mean? Buff, you got pyrotech and shit going, explosions in certain areas. People got to be a explosion. A firework going to go off some fire or something. So, and you got people doing dance routines. You got Dina Howard. Everybody got dance steps. Faith Evan. Everybody got dancers and shit. So the, the stage got to be smooth. You can't come on that motherfucker with liquor. So the only people who come on stage with liquor is at the end, which is the headline. It's Puffy and Biggie and them. So they come out there popping bottles and shit. It's the end of the night. They just got to watch the floor they sell, make sure they don't slip. It ain't endangering nobody else. So they come out popping bottles and shit. They doing their thing. So we like, man, fuck that. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just, how the fuck they can pop bottles? We can pop. So, so we go up there a couple times with our bottles and shit. They warn us, gave us hella warnings and shit. Don't do it. I think one time, the last time, I think one of Dina Howe, somebody dancer fucked up. Somebody, su 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 blah, fucked up on stage. After that, we was out of there. They, they kicked us off for, for bringing liquor on stage, man. So, see, it, was a, it was a hazard. They could sue. You know what right, I mean? You got right. dancers doing dance steps. If that flow's slippery, whoever fall, they could either sue the arena or sue Al Heyman. So, yeah, they kicked us off for just being disrespectful, man. We was young. We didn't know what type of opportunity we had. We fresh dudes off the streets. Our first time seeing Puff and all them. This is when you got cool with Biggie? Yeah, yeah, super. Yeah, selling weed, man. Making weed, make friends, man. I mean, selling weed, make friends, man. Smoking weed, make friends. So, uh, what yeah, was, was it like? What was Biggie like back then? Did you guys ever hang out? Any, any, uh, anything happen? Any stories you could talk oh, about? Man, from shit, the tour? Shit, man. I, I was the battle rapper, man. So we had these battle raps and shit in hotel rooms and lobbies and shit. What's my dude name, man? He's a comedian right now, but I had to battle this guy. And we went for a long time. We was in D.C. What's my dude name, man? He's a buff. He's a, he be doing a lot of stuff on IG. What's my nigga name? But yeah. A comedian from a, back then? Yeah, comedian. He, he, got the, he got the footage, I think. He Faison? talks about it. Not Faze. Hell, Faze, I wasn't rapping back then, man. What's my dude name, man? Uh, a rapper? Uh... He, he don't rap right now in, in this little IG, in this uh, comedian stuff, but he's been on movies and all types of shit. He's very successful, man. Salute to him. But uh, yeah, we was battling, man, and Biggie and them would always sick me out the battle. They knew I was just a freestyle, you know what I mean, period. So they holding on my back like I'm a pit bull and I'm battling this dude. And he tells the same story, man. We went for hell alone. Back to back to back. And that's when Biggie and them, you know, start fucking with me because they knew I was a spitter. Not only did I have the weed, I could really fuck with it like how they do it. You know what I mean? So we, we just clicked on that type of level. Me and the Junior Mafia was hella cool. Me and Little C's and them, hella cool, man. I watched Little C's and them beat up one of their members. They kicked the nigga out the group. You know what I mean? I think he picked on one of the, the littlest Junior Mafia niggas. That whole Junior Mafia, they jumped the big nigga. He was the nigga that rapped like, do it was the, the biggest nigga in Junior Mafia, the, the, the tall nigga. They all jumped that nigga. All them little niggas jumped that nigga, hit the nigga with Coca-Cola cans and shit. We on the tour bus. We on they tour bus, burn it down in front of the hotel. And I think uh, Big just get news that Faith, that's when Faith got on the tour. So Faith just popped on the tour because I, you know, allegedly, you know what I mean, Lil' Kim, was, you know what I mean, and Big was staying in the same hotel room. So this is when motherfuckers hearing that Faith is coming. You know what I mean? So this is when they got to do the little Kim scramble, get her up out of there. In the midst of that, I guess the big dude had a fight with the little dude in Junior Mafia. We all on the tour bus smoking while this shit going down in the hotel. We outside. And they just get to pounding the, the big dude, little C's, all them dudes get to mm, 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 mm. Whoop his ass, and um, they told him what went down, and Big kicked him out the group, and we was in D.C., so they made him catch a cab from D.C. back to New York. They didn't even fly the nigga or nothing. He had to catch a cab. He had to just get the fuck on. 
period, no tour bus or nothing. So I watched them lose a member on that tour. Um, I watched. <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say what. Ha um, what happened when Faith showed up? When Faith showed up, um, I, you know, you know the rumors. You know, what I mean, it is what it is. But um, <laughs> after that incident, Little Kim, everybody had different hotel rooms. You know, what I mean, that's when the shit got separate, and everybody wanted to stand at the same hotel room. So, speaking of that, that's another reason why we got kicked off. So we over here chilling. We in a whole fucking whole another hotel building. Little C's and them burn up their room. Burn up their room. Burn up the what carpet, smoking weed, burn up the carpet, shit catch on fire. So um they blame the shit on the loonies. We ain't even in the same goddamn hotel room. So it's a lot of shit that was getting blamed on us. But and then when we put bought the liquor on stage, it was like the last straw. But we didn't do a, the other shit. We bought the liquor, yeah. That was our first. But the goddamn burning down the hotel, they had to evacuate that hotel. Oh, <laughs> Literally, man. Everybody had to get out. The shit was on fire. They burned the shit, burnt the room down. It wasn't us. We wasn't even there. And then there was an incident where Tretch and them, like, whooped the undercover fucking officer with a fucking, his chain. You know, Tretch was had a big-ass dog gate chain on his neck. They're like, somebody beat somebody up with a gate chain. They came to us, searching our fucking van, our tour, our little van and shit. That searched our whole van, pulled us out, searches and shit. Yeah, yeah, you the guys that beat the guy with the chain. We're like, what the fuck? Who got some fucking, uh, fucking gate chain on their neck? It's only one artist I know on this motherfucker. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. But yeah, we got blamed for that too. They hit us up, man, period. Like, looking for the chain, the dog, the gate chain. And we like, man, we know who that is, man. And y'all know who it is. Is, but they sent it that way to protect them. They the top, they the headliners. You know what I mean? So they gonna protect Tretch and Naughty by nature. They ain't gonna say they beat up an undercover cop with a goddamn neck chain. You know what I mean? A neck, I mean a fucking gate chain. But we got blamed for that. So it was a lot of just bullshit getting blamed on us. But when Faith got on tour, man, um, she became one of my number one weed clients. Yeah, I'm smoking. I'm in, in fake room every morning just selling her weed like I seen her in her boxes and, and tank top just chilling and she had a daughter in there I'm you know what I mean uh, China I think her daughter name is China so yeah I'm like faith was cool as fuck like me and faith was cool as fuck but me and big got cool me and uh, fucking little C's everybody got cool so long story short um they come back to Cali in 97 and they need some tree you know what I mean I'm the weed on tour so of course they're gonna hit the weed and you know at that time i wasn't a weed i fully gave it up but i knew where to get some weed at in la and i picked it up and i bought it to him and um i was able to um be with biggie you know three days before he, he got um he, he went to the um to heaven or, or or to the next you know what i mean the promised land you know what i mean before the drama what happened. was that like what was the conversation like ah uh, that 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 um I, I wanted to warn him. I wanted to just warn him, you know what I mean, when I got there. Because, you know, um, being out here in L.A. is big, but it's not big. You know what I mean? Everybody's tapped in with each other. Everybody know each other. Everybody got somebody working or somebody know this. So I'm telling Big that, yo, I don't know what y'all did, but niggas is mad that y'all wearing red New York hats. So... This is before the multicolor hats were being made. Yeah, you know I mean, this is before the different color New York. This is in '97. That shit ain't been invented. They didn't have a different color Dodger hat. They just had the fucking navy blue Dodger hat. They had the, I mean, the, the royal blue, and they had the motherfucking navy blue New York hat. They didn't have multicolors at that time. So they were going through the, uh, the Beverly Center with red New York Yankee hats on. Motherfuckers in L.A. felt like he was disrespecting the Bloods, Pac everybody so i'm like yo get rid of the hats niggas ain't feeling the hats bro period like you niggas is mad period like you think like people love you out here you come in, no they are mad they angry you got gang people angry and then another thing fuck these bitches you got every bitch that hang at death row right here in your room I'm like, yo, that, them right there, that, that's all death row chicks. Them death row groupies right there. They know where your room is at, bro. 
Like mm -hmm. you gotta, you gotta think more smart, bro. You gotta do your thing like by yourself, man. You gotta separate. So he got out the Four Seasons quick after that. They were staying at the Four Seasons. I let them know like you got death row chicks all through this motherfucker, man. You too loose. These death row groupies, they go right back and let these. They know where you. They know where you at. They know. If you want some all the war shit, they know where you at. Get out of here, bro. Period. So, um, besides that, um, they was talking about Tupac, how much love they have for Tupac. Um, him and um, C's was saying they had a lot of love for Tupac. Um, that they would never set Tupac up. Tupac was the big bro. They had nothing but love for Tupac. They don't know why Pac implicated them in it. You know, Pac no. You know what I mean? Big said that he warned Pac about the people that he was hanging with. Like, yo, them people ain't the right people to, to rock with like that. He said, I told him, I warned him. You know, then he went back and told them, you know what I mean, that I told him. So I tried to warn him not to hang with them people. And, and, and what happened, happened, you know, but I ain't have nothing to do with it. And they thought, we love Pac. Like, Pac did this. He was the first to do your Pac came through with the Rolex. Like, they naming shit that Pac, like, legendary shit that they neighborhood love. Like, oh, remember Pac came through the barbecue on your Pac? Like, they had them type of, you know what I mean? Like, they love fucking Pac. Biggie had love for Pac. Lil C's unconditional love for Pac. And Biggie was like just befuddled, like, yo, we supposed to be just taking this shit over, me and him, why are we out? I don't know what the fuck. So, yeah, that was the conversation, man. And I, I seen it in, in, in his eyes, I, the way they was talking, the, the memories of how Pac used to pull up in their neighborhood and what he did for them. They loved that dude, you know what I mean? Had nothing but love for that dude, period. So that was one of the dope stories I got. Um, they, um, I guess uh, Crush on You was being premiered the following Monday. You know what I mean? That Monday, it was gonna be premiered on um, MTV Crush on You. That's a video with uh, Lil C's and um, Lil' Kim, Junior Mafia. So they got the fucking video. They just got it back, the video of VHS. So we watching, you know what I mean? The video and C's going crazy. We about to kill him, we about to crush it. Yo, 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 yo. And everybody's going crazy, popping bottles of champagne and shit, looking at the video in the hotel room. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, this shit about to get premiered and woo, woo, woo. Yeah, so, yeah, that, that was right when Crush On You was about to be premiered. So, yeah, then uh, three days later, um, I was talking to Big. We were supposed to get him on the um, Looney's album. You know what I mean? He was supposed to be on Lunatic Music. So, um, before that, prior to that, we had did, uh, Puffy had did a, um, a remix of Five on it, like, called Satisfy You with R. Kelly. He did one, you know, not a remix, but he did a five on it do-over with R. Kelly called Satisfy You. So Puff came and got me enough for the remix. So um, we already had a relationship with them doing music and shit. So I'm like, yo, man, tell them, you know, woo, 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 we, we need you on the Lunatic Music. And he's like, yo, get that Puff, it's good, man. Woo, 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 we out here, let's do it. And then three days later, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, he, you know, the, the bullshit happened, so. Rest in peace, Biggie, that was my guy, period. You know, Puff and them treated us right, you know what I mean? Um, as far as the Satisfy You thing, um, a lot of people will redo your music and, and don't even reach out to you, you know what I mean? Puff, he redid that motherfucker with R. Kelly and, and got us on a remix, you know what I mean? Period, gave us a check for that, so I appreciate him for doing that. How many people redid five on it, don't even reach out to us, you know what I mean? So salute to Puff for keeping it a buck. And um, rest in peace to Biggie, man. He was a real nigga, funny as fuck, cool as shit. Junior Mafia, cool as fuck. You know what I mean? Straight up. Definitely, man, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned Five on it. How did Five on it come together? Oh, shit, man. Shout out. Um, it, it's Everybody pitched in on that, man. Um, Numb had an idea. So shout out Numb. Numb came up with the idea. To, um, to rap about what it takes to get the weed instead of rapping about being high. So it was a lot of songs about just being high. Everybody, I'm high, I'm high, I'm high. But we teenagers at this time, and niggas pitch in, teenagers pitch in, five, five, get you a 10 sack, you know, four people pitch in, five, 20 sack, you know, gas money, pitch in a couple dollars, we got gas money, pitch in for the 40 ounce, uh, you know what I mean, whatever liquor we getting, it was a pitch in type of game when we was teenagers, you know what I mean, pitching in for the Henny, pitching in, so, now I was like, yo, I got five on it, I got five, what you got, nigga? And I'm a freestyle expert, I'm like, damn, I think I got two bucks in my sock, nigga, and then we just kept freestyling, 
And then we're like, yo, let's write this shit down. And so that's how the original five owner got made to where you hear the, the real one, the real five owners, me and them going back to back, just rapping about going to get a sack. Yeah, I mean, then you get the verses that you hear on the first and second verse. So when the label got it, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fast forwarding. So boom, we freestyling and we in a trap. You know what I mean? We in a motherfucking trap. Like we on this, um, CNH had this house for us to just vibe and record and shit and write rhymes and shit, man. Like this apartment, and this motherfucker is in the trap, 62nd and Bancroft. Like this whole fucking apartment building is lit. So we in that motherfucker and we, we grimy, you know what I mean? We was broke at that time. We was really pitching in five to go get some weed. So we freestyled and shit, wrote the shit down. And um, True Down already had Pimp of the Year with Ant Banks. Ant Banks made that. Drew Down made his whole album at Dangerous Studios, produced by Ant Banks and them. So we like, it's our turn, you know what I mean? Um, what we gonna do to be as good as Pimp of the Year? Like, what remake can we flip? And I was like, let's do the Club Nouveau. They was like, what, the rumors? The rumors, everybody did the rumor. I said, no, why you treat me so bad? And I was like, hell yeah! So we go, um, Telegraph. We go to North Oakland, Telegraph, at some record store. I remember like it was yesterday. We go to North Oakland, we buy the album, and we got a studio session that night with Tone Capone. So we give the record to Tone Capone. We're like, this is what we want to do. We want you to, you know, remake this. Tone not only remakes it, but he outdoes the original. Like he fucks the original. Like the original can't fuck with what Tone did. So he outdoes the beat. We like, oh my, like he, we think he just gonna sample how it is. He played all that shit all over and did his own shit that just was fucking like, wow. So I had the hook, you know what I mean? I had the hook. So we lay our shit, we lay the back to back verse and um, I lay the hook. Then first verse and then um, last verse. So when I laid the hook, Tone was like, eh. It's dope, but I think I think somebody should sing that. I'm like, hell no, nah, man. It's gonna it's gonna kill him with, with just me saying it. So we leave the studio session and um we come back one day and boom, Mike Marshall's on that motherfucker. So Tone had knew Mike Marshall that was a part of the Timex Social Club. You know I mean, which was a part of which was you know what I mean, which sprung off the Club Nouveau after they broke up. So he's a part of the original squad, and we have him singing a fucking hook on their sample. So that right there was fucking mind blowing, and that tone knew this guy and was able to pull him in and have him do it. And then um, shit, the the rest is history, man. And we had we did that song in '93, right after the Ice Cream Man. We did that shit in '93, and we tucked it. So we put out our little our little mixtape with the condom man on it. You know what I mean? The little mixtape that didn't have ice cream man on. It. I mean a uh, five on it on it. So we put out our mixtape. Drew Down gets signed. Everybody gets signed, and we get signed just for being on Drew Down album, the Ice Cream Man on our mixtape. And when we came to the table with version, we already had that shit. We kept in a, in a, in a fucking vault from '93. This is '94 now. You know what I mean? When we go up in them offices and we boom, play five on it. They're like, oh, they got it. They got their fucking hit single already. But it's too long. Y'all rapping for fucking 100 bars each fucking verse. You got to chop it down to a 16, 16 hook, hook, and split a, split a verse on the last one. So we had to chop it up, chop our verses up and shit like that. Take the, the first verse, we'll be going back to back, take that off and make it radio friendly. And once we did that, they put it out and shit, man, it hit. That shit, man, that shit did numbers. Everybody got on it then. We took a page out of Puff book, you know what I mean? That's why I think Puff fucked with us because he's seen that we bit flavor of the year. You know, Puff was the first one with Craig Mack, you know what I mean? Craig Mack had a song called Flavor of the Year and that shit was bonkers. Like that shit was going crazy. And then Puff put his artist, Biggie, all his artists on that motherfucker, LL Cool J, Busta Rhymes, everybody on that motherfucker, right? And made a, a fucking moment in hip hop that wasn't made. You know what I mean? To where you got different rappers. Like you have songs with rappers on the same label together or the same crew, but not different rappers from all walks of life all in one song. 
Puff did that first. So we were like, okay, let's do a Flavor of the Year type of remix to where we have all the top Bay Area artists on this motherfucker. Just like Puff had all the top New York artists on Flavor of the Year. So we did that with the Five on the remix and that shit went bigger than the original Five on it. Like, literally, and then we did the, the video, that shit go crazy. And then by that time, we on tour with Puff and them, so. Yeah. Man, that, that song was huge. That was like definitely the, the summer anthem. Man, shout out Numb, shout out Tone Capone, shout out Mike Marshall, shout out uh, uh, Club Nouveau for even clearing the sample. You know what I mean? Uh, 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 the King fella, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, man, um, CNH. You know what I mean? Our executive producer, you know what I mean? For hooking us up with a producer like Tone Capone. We didn't know Tone Capone. You know what I mean? That was CNH homie. Um, CNH homie Dollars and Spence. You know what I mean? Spence, that was his production. So them two being homies, you know what I mean? They start working with each other with the artists and shit. So Spence had artists and CNH had artists. So they start, you know, working together. And with that relationship came us working with Tone Capone by working with um, CNH and Dollars and Spence being together. So that's how that happened. So it's a lot of dots was connected. You know what I mean? We didn't know Tone. That shit wouldn't have never happened without that connection that CNH had with Spence. You know what I mean? Which Spence, you know, and Tone and them had a deal together and that was his production team and we went through that. So it's a lot of shit that wouldn't happen. You know what I mean? Like it's a, like, a lot of little lucky yeah, situations. We that was lucky just as shit. Fell into place for you. It, we, we couldn't have do, we couldn't have did that shit by ourselves. I think if if we were signed with somebody else, five on it wouldn't have got made. Period. Like mm. that shit happened because of we 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 fuck with what was was given to us. You know what I mean? We didn't have no Tone Capone. Like Tone Capone at that time wasn't no Ann Banks. He wasn't hitting like that. Nobody knew Tone Capone had a group. So nobody was getting no Tone Capone beaks like that hit that made no singles at that time. So when we got with Tone Capone, we loved him because he had that type of hip hop type of vibe. You know what I mean? Like he had that boom bap. And it, yeah, he had that shit, you know what I mean? Like, he could, like Tone had, it was different than uh, Aunt Banks to me. Aunt Banks was more funk, soul, you know what I mean? Tone was like, yo, we could play this shit in New York or anywhere. It was more universal. So when we got with Tone, we was like, oh shit. Yeah, this is who we need to produce with. This is who we need to want to do our album. We didn't do no Aunt Banks. Aunt Banks did Drew shit, Tone did our shit. That was our producer. That was our vibe. So we love Tone, period. You uh, you know, man, I looked this song up before we did the interview. And this shit's kind of crazy, man. It has 134 million views just since 2012. Yeah. Like, that's how much this song is a classic, man. I mean, you guys still own your publishing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you guys, I mean, this song, it must have been, it must have been paying you pretty good over the what 25 plus years or five something on still pay my bills <laughs> five on it still pay the bills man you know um shout out to jordan peele you know for the uh look on um the us movie that just rebirthed it you know what i mean like that re that rebirthed it to the youth of the generation that's now like five on is hella old but when it came out on that movie you got young teenagers and, and people in college and you got marching bands and shit like that in, in college playing five on it because of the movie you know what i mean that just re reinvented the song period so shout out to jordan peele for giving us the opportunity um came with a big check everybody got paid off that motherfucker even people on the remix got paid from that jordan peele movie across the board so Shout out to Jordan Peele, man. Um, yeah, he, he just brought new life to I Got Five on it. And then, especially making it a creepy, fucking um, Jason, Freddy Krueger type of version when he slowed it down. And I'm like, okay, I see. Like, I ain't never heard or thought Five on it to be a creepy, you know what I mean? Like, scary type of, you know what I mean? Music, but Tone said he always felt it was dark thought that five on it was dark. I thought it was happy. I never thought it was dark. And when they slowed it down, they made it dark. I'm like, oh shit. And Tone was like, oh, I always thought it was dark. Tone Capone. Mm -hmm. I never, but when you listen to it, 
And if you do slow it down, how us, it's dark than a motherfucker, but I never thought about it like that. But for them to slow it down and make a different version of the shit and just reinvent the shit, yo, we, we still living. Like it, just, like, it just came out again. You know what I mean? Fresh, brand new. So the little kids that never heard of, heard of, heard of the loonies or heard of Yuck Mouth or Numbskull or Tone Capone or Mike Marshall or whatever, they get a fresh, you know what I mean? reintroduction of us, man. And um, yeah, it, it's popping. A lot of people is redoing five on it again. A lot of people is playing the shit. Um, it's a lot of love going down, period. So it's crazy so, after yeah. all this time. That's that's amazing. Like, you know what I'm saying? Just like being real, like yeah. after all this time to still be doing those type of numbers, man, that's you know what I'm saying like that's not too many people, man. Even dudes that had, you know, platinum, 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 like they never, they might, they probably never had that type of song that had that kind of impact. Right, right, You know, right. like that's just um, crazy, man. That shit amazing, amazing. Yeah. Like I said, amazing, amazing. I've been sipping a little, excuse the, uh, the couple fumbles on the word, but um, yeah, man, it's amazing. I think like you say, the, the stars lined up, the galaxies lined up, the planets, whatever they want to say, that shit lined up. It lined up and, and it hit, you know what I mean? Period, when we came out, we was over Michael Jackson for four weeks. Mm. No, three weeks. Or with Biggie Autumn for, for for three weeks on on the Billboard chart with the album. Not the single, the album. Wow. Yeah, yeah, when we first dropped Billboard uh, top top one hundred. Yeah you know I mean, so yeah, man, um it, it it made so much waves. I think that when we outdid Mike for them three weeks, that's why we end up getting on Quincy Jones album. You know what I mean? The uh the juke I mean, yeah, the ju the juke joint. You know what I mean? Mm. Like Quincy Jones would do these albums, you know what I mean, compilation album, b back on the block albums, where you have all the top artists and top singers and R&B people, you know what I mean, come on a whole type of compilation, ju you know, Chrissy Jones produce production album. So he had the juke joints and the back to the block and back on the blocks. So we happen to be a part of one of the juke joints, and I think it's because when we outdid Mike them three weeks, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the song that we get Grammy nominated for. Everybody thought Five on it was Grammy nominated. Nah, it's a song on Quincy Jones' album mm -hmm. called Stump. You know, with Shaquille O'Neal, Coolio, Us, hella people. It's hella people on that song. It's like a hella people. So that's the song that gets Grammy nominated, not Five on it. You had mentioned uh, Tupac. Yes, sir. In the past. Um, how'd you meet Tupac? Basically, uh... Uh, let's see, how did I meet Pop? I think through shocking him, you know what I mean? Through Dizzle Underground. Definitely like the, the formal introduction. Definitely for Dizzle Underground, I think. Um, this was before Pac blew up, I take it. Hell no, I wasn't part of D DU or none of that. Um, my cousin and them, my cousin the Gov, he, he was dealing with Pac and shit, you know what I mean, during that era. I was a young kid, so um, we was more of a Dizzle Underground type of people, you know what I mean? So let's go back, let's rewind to me and them school going to Westlake Junior High School. Westlake Junior High School by Lake Merritt. Money B lived two blocks from the high school. So Money B would drive up and down the street in his drop top uh, Mustang and shit. So we, we fucking, you know, just underground out. And then one of their cousins or nephews went to our school. So Money B would be picking them up and shit. So we was more tapping into Digital Underground. So when the Five on the Thing happened and um, Digital Underground got on the um, remix, that be began our real relationship, like industry relationship with Digital Underground. So Pac was locked up while we doing this. You know what I mean? While the Five on the remix was done, Pac was locked up. So we didn't really get able to fuck with him. You know what I mean? Period. But when he got out of jail, we added a song for one of the soundtracks. Um, and uh, we was doing a video for it. It was a song for Shock G and them. And we went to the video shoot in LA and Pac showed up. So that gave us a formal introduction to Pac at that video shoot. Oh, uh, okay. Which was in 96, 96. So oh, you didn't meet Pac till, oh wait. 96, uh, yeah. You didn't meet him till 96. Uh-huh. Because he got out in October, 95. Like, I, like around October. So, yeah, right right after that, like literally, right after that. Like, I wanna say January or something, we met him, you know? Okay, were you guys gonna do any music or anything together, or? Um, music did get done, you know what I mean? Um, Pop, 
you know, he was listening to the loonies and uh, Drew Down, you know what I mean, period. So he, he had an admiration for us. So he was doing the, um, the All Lives On Me, you know, um, and uh, Drew Down, I guess, was at the same hotel Pac was staying at. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, they uh, Big Sykes seen him in the lobby, like, Pac upstairs, nigga, you wanna holler at you? So uh, that's when, um, that's the, the, allegedly the uh, the night when um, uh, Faith came over to the room and Drew Down was in the room when she came up. And yeah, Pac was like, nigga, watch who, who I got. Or some shit like that. You ain't gonna believe who coming. He said, answer the door. So Drew answered the door and it was Faith. You know what I mean? Allegedly. <laughs> this is the, the story Drew now tell. So it was Faith and Pac like, yeah, man, I got this. And Drew had to bounce. But the next day he tell Drew to come to the studio. And he on the, um, the intro of uh, Wonder Why You Call You Bitch. One of those. Uh, no, 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 no. Is it, uh, he on the intro of one of those. I, I want to think, uh, every, same hoes. He on the intro to Outro, oh, he's on the outro. Is it a uh... the outro or the intro? Of one of the motherfuckers, man. I think it's all about you. I thought I was about to say. I think it is all. Yeah, I think it's all about yeah, you. It's all about yeah. He on the intro, all about you. So, uh, yeah, Drew went to the studio the next day and um, did all about you. And uh, yeah, that's how um, Drew down got on the motherfucker. And um, after that, um, Pac started working on Machiavelli, and at the same time, he's working on Machiavelli. He's working on the album called One Nation. So that's when he had um, everybody from the East Coast, you know what I mean, the Midwest, down South, and the West Coast all on one album. So he was dealing with the Goody Mob, he was dealing with Smith and Wesson, you know what I mean, Eric B, you know what I mean, Greg Nice, you know what I mean, just dealing with a lot of people, you know what I mean, a lot of people on the West Coast and shit. So um, yeah, he wanted us to get on the album. So Numb does a studio session and get on the album. I'm locked up at this time, the Drew Down, does a session and get on the album. I never get on the album because I'm locked up, so it never happened with me. But the one time I was in a Can-Am studio with Pac trying to record, I got, I just, um, I got rubbed the wrong way by Pac. <laughs> okay. Everybody know this story when I was like, uh, and I get it because now that I'm the dude that people ask, what are we that? I get what he was saying, so. Um, I asked Pac, we was at Can-Am Studios, and Pac and them had the front studio, Snoop and them had the back studio. So, um, I'm in Pac and them studio. Now, while I'm trying to go in Pac and them studio, and Pac is coming out the studio. I'm like, Pac, where the weed at? He's like, nigga, I ain't the weed, nigga, I don't sell weed. And he spin off and just keep, like, he was just on his way somewhere. I ain't the weed, nigga, I don't sell weed. And just, I just dip. I was like, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> and I get it, because I don't sell weed, nigga. I'm Tupac. I get it. But at that time, little nigga, hyphy, like, nigga, what the nigga just say to me, nigga? Fuck this session, man. So I left his session and went to the back and snooping them session. They just had weed on the table everywhere. Like, nigga, roll up. Roll up, roll up. And it was that type of vibe on Snoop shit. Pop was, ain't the weed, nigga. Like, I was like, all right, my nigga. So. That was a um, yeah, night at Can-Am that I was kind of heated at Pac. And it was a misunderstanding me taking it too personal. Like, I I tell niggas I ain't the weed, man. To this day, I'm like, I ain't the weed, man. I can't sell you nothing, but here you go. Roll something up. You know what I mean? So I took it. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I went overboard with what I was taking. I got too personal. And to somebody that you like, this Pac, and the nigga Pac come out, iced out, he, you know what I mean? Nigga ain't the weed, nigga. <laughs> it crushed you, all your, you know what I mean? All your shit about Pac just crushed you, like, ah, fuck that nigga. <laughs> and, and Gemini's, you know what I mean? I deal with a few, my mom was a Gemini, so you gotta catch them on their good days, you know what I mean? When they're built. And then a Gemini could be somebody totally different, so I think, I caught him on one of them days when he was totally different, but I understand what he was getting at, but he didn't have to yell. <laughs> he had to yell it, ain't the motherfucker. You know what I mean? You could just be like, yo, man, I don't sell weed, but my niggas in there rolling up, man. Go go try to find something. He could have been like that. He yelled at a nigga, like, I don't know what he was going through, but yeah. You uh, you did That's a tribute a song. Spot. Yeah, still, yeah. Still, Hell even yeah. after that. Hell yeah, right after that, man. And um, I did it because, you know, Shout out Tretch, you know what I mean? Tretch was the only one that really did a, a song after Pac died, and I seen a lot, Biggie getting a lot of love. 
as he should. You know what I mean? Biggie was getting a lot of love, and I didn't see that shit going with Pac. I didn't see that come from, you know, the death row imprint, like it came from the bad boy imprint, you know? So um, I wrote a song about it, you know what I mean? Pac was still balling, you know what I mean? Remade one of his uh, hits, I mean, uh, remade one of his songs called Straight Balling, you know, that was on the, um, the Above the Rim soundtrack, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, it just, just gave a tribute to Pac, you know what I mean? Then I did the remix and got the Outlaws on it that make sure it's official tissue. Like, I'm not trying to run it up on pop. None of that shit. Like, I'm already the five on the dude. We got money. So um, I'm not trying to make a career off this dude, but I think it was what was missing at the time. It was a lot of, a lot of biggie, you know what I mean, tributes and no Tupac. One, one true Tupac tribute, which came from Tretch at that time. I was frustrated myself. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, I was a big Pac fan at the time, I'm man. Like, I, he got I'm like, he got it. I'm like, where are, all the tributes, you know, but I didn't know that him and Snoop had a falling out. Me neither. Right before he Me died. Me neither. You know, we all seeing this shit now. I never yeah. knew. Yeah, I'm wondering so like, why ain't why Snoop, Snoop doing no, do one. don't know your own tribute? You know, we didn't know the, the issue with him and Snoop or the dog pound or none of that shit. That's inner shit that nobody knew about until now. Like shit is coming out. But from the outside looking in, we like, why the fuck Snoop didn't do it, mm -hmm. or why this person didn't do it, or why that. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it. You know what I mean? Period. I ain't the right one. I ain't got no connection to this nigga like this. I'm not thug life. I'm not an outlaw, but I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it right to where I'm going to get the outlaws on the remix and let them hear how they feel about it. You know what I mean? Somebody that's really part of his, you know what I mean, lineage or his crew. You know what I mean? So I made that clear. Like, yo, we're getting the outlaws for the remix. And not only did I get the outlaws for the remix, um, I helped. You know what I mean? Bring them to, to rap a lot to get them a deal at rap a lot. You know what I mean? They left Death Row and came to rap a lot. You know what I mean? I, so I was part of, you know what I mean, helping them do that. You know what I mean? And it's out of love for the music that Tupac, you know what I mean? The Outlaws, Thug Life, everybody have done. And that shit needs to continue. Like everybody was continuing Biggie shit, but nobody was continuing Pac shit. And I'm like, yo, the people who continue this, who gonna continue Pac legacy is the fucking outlaws. They young, and they gonna keep this shit lit, period. So I was like, yo, the outlaws need the torch, period. And this is what Pac would want. So I just spent my time trying to help them on the side, besides doing the song, trying to help them get in a position to just keep the movement going. You know I mean, period, and right back at me, you know what I mean? Like when I was dealing with bullshit, they shot me a lot of alley-oops. Still to this day, we shoot each other alley-oops because it's that type of um, brotherhood, you know what I mean, period. So I got love for the outlaws and I wanted nothing but the best for them and um, just to give the, the help, you know what I mean, give them an opportunity to keep that, that pop wave going. So not only did I did the remix, I, I was, you know, trying to help keep the, the torch lit with the outlaws. That's what's up, man. At the beginning stages. Now, they they, they going to keep it lit by themselves, of course, but I was trying to help out, you know? That's what's up. That's what's up, man. Salute to all the outlaws, man. Definitely. Did you ever meet DMX? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, we were supposed to, you know, we was managed by the same manager, Uncle Ray. So Uncle Ray was my manager. That's DMX's uncle, bar management. So that's how I got the song Puff and Lie. Which, which is uh, produced by Rough Rider Productions, uh, fucking uh, P Killer Tracks. I got uh, Stuntastic, which is produced by Dame Grease, another motherfucking Rough Rider uh, producer. So through Uncle Ray, I was able to get that production. You know what I mean? And um, I was supposed to do a song with X one night, but uh, we was too busy, you know what I mean? But when I met X, it was out here in LA, Enterprise Studios, um, shooting pool, tank top, like a motherfucker, tank top, shooting pool. Ray walks me in, it's a, it's a kitchen area in an enterprise studio and at the, uh, the pool table. So he's in the kitchen area paying pool. And uh, they introduced me, you know what I mean? Like, oh, this yuck, yuck. Oh, I heard you, son. I heard, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, you, you with the man. He was like bigging up Uncle Ray, cause that's his uncle. And I'm getting managed by him. Like, Uncle Ray managed me too, man. You in good hand, yo. yo. So, tap that, that, boom, and I wiggle. So, yeah, that's the first time I met DMX through Uncle Ray. You know what I mean? Which is his uncle, which is managed me and him and everybody else. So, yeah, I was managed by Uncle Ray. Was that your only time running into him? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Axel okay. was always on the, on the move. I was more, you know, with the production team. You know what I mean? Like I was getting my music done. You know what I mean? Like um, I'm at in uh, Harlem. You know, at vacant lot. You know, um, fucking with uh, Dame Grease. You know, what I mean, I'm at the Rough Rider Studios and, and Yonkers. You know, what I mean, fucking with P Killer Tracks. You know, just getting my my level up. You know, what I mean, everybody was doing their thing. You know, what I mean, everybody. This is when DMX dropped the two albums in one year. Like he's on fire. It's hard to catch this nigga. So, yeah. But um, we had did another song too. I mean, our first song we ever did together came through uh, CNH. You know, what I mean, um, our, my um old executive producer that was signed to, uh, he, he did an a album called Turf Stories, and he had a lot of um, a lot of DMX Rough Riders on that motherfucker, so he put a, got a song with me, DMX, and a drag on on that bitch. So that's the first track I ever did with DMX, but it was set up through uh, my ex record label. Mm. Or not Uncle Ray. You <laughs> didn't get a chance to do it in the studio with him. I was supposed to record that night, when I met him, but um, some bullshit that happened with me at the studio to where I had to dip, so I fucked that session up. But we were supposed to go in the lab that night when I met him, so I fucked gotcha. that one up. You know. You mentioned earlier about the ice cream man situation. Yeah. What, what all happened with all that? So remember <laughs> earlier in the interview, I said I kept that song a secret because I didn't want nobody to steal it. But I didn't know that somebody would eventually steal it. So. <clears throat> Let me give you the Ice Cream Man story. So before I got to the studio and battle rap, rap and rhyme, or before I even turned the dope deal to the record deal, I was rapping this shit in the neighborhood and every nigga in the village knew my shit word for word. So Seagram, rest in peace, he was signed to rap a lot at the time. So this is when you had to have a beeper or you had to have a motherfucker phone number, landline. You know what I mean? So this motherfucker called my grandma house, the landline, Seagram. I'm like, what up? He like, the, the Seagram. I'm like, how the fuck you get my number? It's an OG. I'm like, hell yeah, what's up with you? He's like, yeah, man, you got a song called Ice Cream Man. I'm like, hell yeah. He's like, let me buy it. I'm thinking he calling like, okay, I'm signed to rap a lot, nigga. I'm about to bring you over there and rap a lot with me, man. This nigga calling me to tell me he want to buy Ice Cream Man. Seagram. And I'm like, ah. So I got $1,000 for you. $1,000? I'm looking at $5,000 stacked on my table right now from just me hitting the block. And I'm like, $1,000? <laughs> Man, no thanks. But good looking, my G. I appreciate you hollering. Bye. Click. Some told me to just hold on to that song. This before I even made the, the dope deal. I mean, the, the dope deal into a record deal with, with CNH. So boom, some say hold on to that song. Some say don't sell it. Don't sell it to Seagram. The dope deal come through, say that song. The song I said, don't sell to Seagram. I say that verse. Get the deal, right? Next day, got a battle. I don't say it because Seagram just tried to buy this motherfucker. Seagram, he signed to rap a lot. A real artist that signed to a record label try to buy this song. I have all these motherfucking record label songs. I mean, these record label artists in the building. I don't want to say it, just a concept alone. Ice Cream Man. That You could take that anywhere. It don't have to be my shit word for word. It could just a concept alone. I'm not giving that to them. So I didn't say it. Lost the battle. If I would have said it, I would have won the battle. But the song wouldn't have came out because somebody would have beat me to the punch. So at this time, Master P has a fucking record a uh, fucking record store selling records in Richmond, California at this time. So he's selling this shit. He's selling Ice Cream Man on Drew Down's album, Fool from the Streets. He's selling this shit at his record shop. He knows exactly who the fuck the Ice Cream Man is. You know how close Oakland and Richmond is? As know. close as motherfucking LAX and Inglewood or whatever, like mm. close, like right next to each other, like five minutes down the freeway, nigga. So you know, we made this fucking video. We got the ice cream truck. We on all the video, video jukebox, soul beat. We on all the shit. You seeing this shit? So boom, we do this in '93. Hit him up with the ice cream man shit. He comes out in '90. 
I want to say 96, right after. We go hella hard. We go hella hard. Nobody really know how the loonies look worldwide. We go hard. We go three times platinum. Then he comes out right after that. Ice Cream Man album. And he's looking like CNH. He has the fucking Ice Cream Man suit on. Put, I want you to clip in the motherfucking video, our Ice Cream Man video. Clip it in. Show when CNH get dressed in the Ice Cream Man suit, the white Ice Cream Man suit. Walk to the Ice Cream truck with the triple gold dates and shit and ride off. P got the same exact motherfucking outfit CNH got on in the video. But instead of the white ice cream truck on triple gold dates, it's a fucking white Lexus on triple gold dates. The ice cream man. Same shit, yeah. same image, same everything. And instead, like I said, you could take the concept. You don't gotta say it word for word how we see. He took the concept. And instead of rapping it, he sung it's the ice cream. Man. He sung it and made it more groovy than, than street. We made it street. He made it more groovy and more something for you because doing the club or, you know what I mean, jingle to, whatever. So he made it more groovy and then try to take credit for the shit. You know what I mean? Like, yo, man, I'm the ice cream man. Nobody the ice cream man. Like, nigga, nobody knew you in Oakland as being the ice cream man, my nigga. Let's be real. You weren't selling no bricks, my nigga. You were selling fucking records at a record shop, my nigga. Period. Our executive producer... That nigga name was CNH Pure Cane Sugar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was his nickname. <laughs> Your nickname was Percy Miller or Master P. He got that name for a reason in the streets. Our executive producer got that name for the reason. Uh, for you know what I mean? Real shit. You didn't get that name. You wasn't a boy out here. When crack first got invented, you wasn't out here wiggling and with them kingpins and the motherfucking kingpins in Oakland and Frisco and Richmond that's doing their thing. You wasn't doing that. Only a, a select few could say that. And he wasn't one. You got to, uh, no disrespect to Master P. His business moves and all that, I'm talking about at the beginning. You wasn't that. You wasn't a nigga that had bricks and quarter bricks and half brick, none of that shit. You didn't have a block, a tether, a hood. I don't know what you had in Richmond, but you wasn't running that motherfucker. You, nobody said Master P ran shit in Richmond. Richmond is an animal, a, a whole fucking animal. Nobody could run Richmond. Now, you, nobody could run Oakland, but you wasn't a big boy in Richmond to where Richmond niggas was vouching and talking about him on some street shit. Not at all. You was the record man. You was the CD man. Not the, you know, the cassette, cassettes. You was a cassette man. You were an ice cream man. Period. Oh, not one block, none of that shit in the Bay. Nobody ever respected him like, oh, that's the boy. Nobody. So when he came with the shit, and real street niggas from the Bay knew, like, who's this nigga? Now, down south, he went down south and pulled it off. That's when he made the move. Now, he was doing West Coast Bad Boys, and everybody's fucking with him. Like, okay, West Coast Bad Boys, he got all the underground artists from Oakland, Richmond, Vallejo, all this shit, Sacramento, we got us all on this motherfucker. Woo, 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 we fucking with him. And then he moved down south and come Ice Cream Man. And we like, he wasn't that. He was the nigga talking about true and guns, and she never taught him, like, where's this kilo man and bird, like, when? Are we all trying to figure this shit out? So when he said it, he wasn't really doing it. He took it from us. Cause he seen the wave that it made in the Bay Area. Oh, they did it small time. I'm gonna do it bigger than they did it. And that's his, that's his approach. And he won. That was his first platinum album or whatever. And after that, he kept it going. So for him not to give us our respect. Oh man, yeah, somebody did it, but I did it better. Like, dog, that little bullshit, nigga. You wasn't an ice cream man, nigga. You went out there that, with that work in Oakland, nigga. Period. Let's be real, nigga. You was a college ball player. You, I don't know how you got your money. I ain't gonna, you know, you got a, a settlement. You open a fucking record shop. You wasn't on the block. You wasn't with them niggas that could, that could cook a whole kilo up at one time. You wasn't that nigga. People that was around us and niggas I grew up with was that. This is what I'm rapping about. Nigga, I'm, I'm raised in, 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 
and the shit. I'm watching niggas cook up bricks. One nigga in Oakland could cook up a brick at one time. And this motherfucker was doing it at my house. Mm. Nobody could cook one brick up. At, you had to divvy that shit up. That's why I could make a song called The Ice Cream Man. This is... I'm not out there playing ball and doing all this shit trying to go to college. I'm watching it cook a whole bricks and then I'm cooking up ounces, nigga. I got a deal. I turned a record, a drug deal to a fucking record deal. Mm. I'm really from that cloth. So the shit you talking about didn't add up. And real Bay Area niggas did knew he stole from us. And he know exactly the real hitters and the real kingpins in the Bay Area was not him at all. And the niggas that was the kingpins was behind the real niggas like us and Too Short and all that, the kingpins. The real niggas that could say what he talking about. And he wasn't one of them, never. So for him to be cocky like, I was like, yeah. you want no nigga in the Bay? Niggas ran him, he got ran up out to, he got ran up out of Oakland. Got mm -hmm. ran up out of there, bro. Niggas pulling up to shows and shit, it's, it's ugly. You gotta go. It's ugly, bro, period, it's ugly. P wasn't really from that cloth, like, at that time. I don't know what he did after that, but at that time, we never heard about him really out there in the streets like that. So when he did it, it was a smack in the face to the whole Bay Area. You know what I mean? Like, the whole Bay was proud of that because you got so many bosses, so many kingpins, so many different turfs and shit involved with the success of not only Drew Down, not only the Loonies, Too Short, like everybody that's Richie Rich, all, we all the same clique and crew. Real motherfuckers that do this shit. So when that shit came and niggas was like, blood, look at, like who? When, who? Name one nigga that bought some work from this nigga, man. How's he the ice cream man? And he made it look like he was the biggest kingpin drug dealer in the fucking bay. And he wasn't at that time. I don't think he ever was. Ever in life, period. So you talk that shit, you gotta really live. You gotta really live it, bro. You can't be fake or a gimmick. That was a gimmick. He gimmicked it. He gimmicked the shit out of it, bro. He was selling albums. He wasn't selling cream. So people were on. People were on him. Oh yeah. After he did that, because it's fake. You can't be faking in Oakland. You can't be fake. You can't be faking the Bay. They gonna check you for it. Period. We don't do the gimmick shit. We don't do the vanilla ices. None of that shit. You getting checked. Period. Straight up. So, it is what it is, man. And, um, more of the story, um, me and P, you know what I mean? Shout out to big homie T.Y., man. He got me and P together, you know what I mean? In the same room together, and we squashed it. You know what I mean? Period. The whole ice cream man beef. And, um, P, um, broke it down to me in a way that I never looked at it. He made perfectly good sense, though. Perfectly good sense. Um, it was like, yo, can I beef with every nigga that say, uh, or a nigga say, ah, nah, 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 nah. Or every nigga that say a tank or a soldier, or a nigga that wear camouflage, can I just beef with everybody that do that? Or can I appreciate what I brought to the table and people following it? You tell me. And I was like, yeah. You're supposed to, if you put something out there and you trend set, you know what I mean? People gonna follow it. He said, that's what we did. Y'all set some trends out there in the Bay to where niggas wasn't called the dope man no more, the D-boy, y'all called it the ice cream man. It became the trend in the Bay Area. So we following a trend that y'all made and everybody's saying it all around the Bay. So we came with our own version of it. Just being the trend that y'all started. It's still giving salute to y'all, you know? because we're saying some shit that you invented, that you said. So I'm like, okay, you're right. He's like, man, if I would be for everybody that say nah, 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 or you know what I mean? Or wear a tank or, you know what I mean? I'd be beefing with a lot of motherfuckers, man. He said, sometimes you gotta take it as a, um, as a motherfucker um, really um, fucking with the wave that you created. You know what I mean? And you create waves and movements to where you want everybody to get in line and do it, but don't get mad when somebody does it and they outdo you at it. You know what I mean? Don't get mad. And I understood that. Like, okay, I get it. You know, it was a trend when we came out and called. I mean, shit, fucking Friday took the whole Big Worm shit from Ice Cream Man video shoot. So it was a couple things that got stolen, but we set the trend. 
why be mad if we set a legendary a legendary trend that made people follow follow suit so he said y'all should be proud of yourself you know what i mean instead of being mad at motherfuckers you know what i mean that follow something y'all created so when he said that, i said you're absolutely right my nigga we dap it up and beef was squashed so when I was getting real, you know what I mean, emotional about him not being in the streets, he wasn't at that time. I don't know when he was. He probably in, in New Orleans and the Calio, but in, I don't know. I didn't hear about it. You know what I mean? We didn't hear about it. We heard about sports. We heard about a record record uh, company. I mean, a record, uh, uh, record shop. We were selling a lot of product. Mom's a pop store. We didn't hear nothing about no legendary street tales and shit like that. You know what I mean? So, but his brother, you know what I mean? His, his brother that went to, went to jail for a long time. One of, one of them dudes that got locked up is legendary in Richmond. One of them dudes is legendary, but not him. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Period. So, it is what it is. But uh, shout out to Master P. Shout out to the whole No Limit. You know what I mean? It wasn't really no real beef like we had some demonstrations in the street nobody got hurt beat up or none of that shit so when me and Pete met we was able to just squash the shit and it was done mm -hmm. how long after all this happened did you guys meet um it was like around i want to say like 2010 oh that long yeah it was it was a long time but um when i got to rap a lot you know what i mean uh jay prince and p were real close they had a real close business association so jay was like yo he with me like you know what i mean it, it ain't happening on, on my watch, you know what I mean, period. So just me being tied in with a lot of his homies, you know what I mean? His people's like kind of really squashed it, you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, him being tied in with Jay, I think that probably really squashed it, you know what I mean? And then my homie T.Y., he was tied in with my homie T.Y. out here in L.A. He, he's the owner of Fathead Clothing. So he had the Fathead Clothing with the Benjamin Franklin, all the bedazzles and shit, Floyd Mayweather, everybody wearing it. Um, and him and P was doing a company together at the time, and this is one of my ace boom coons. So he invited me up, unsuspectingly, invites Master P. So <laughs> just put me there in front of him, like, man, y'all squash this shit, man. Y'all both my homies, and that's how we did it. That's how it happened. So, yeah, you know what I mean? Shout out T.Y., shout out Master P for keeping it a buck. And, um, yeah, I ain't got no problems with that man business. He's an expert business dude, you know what I mean, period. But... You wanted me to tell the story how the ice cream man should happen, and that's it. You know what I mean? It, it was, it was a vibe. It was a wave, and everybody, you know, hopped on the on the surfboard. No Frank Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Real shit. Real yeah. shit, man. You know, back in the early, probably like the early '90s, they used to have like hip hop conventions. Jack yes. the Rapper. Right. Right. And I believe you went went to some of them or a few of them. Went to one. Went to one. Yeah. What, what was that like? Mm. <laughs> that Jack the Rapper that I went to was the wildest motherfucking Jack the Rapper in life, man. That ended up being a Jack the Rapper where we on Rhyme and Reason. Where the uh, Rhyme and Reason uh, video was made. You know, you see us out there with Puff and them. Me and them skulls. So, Biggie, you see him out there. We saw Biggie when, before he was Big Papa. We saw him when he was notorious, like grimy. Looking like Daz Effects with the hoodie and shit on, the boots, the Timbs. You know what I mean? Saw Red Man when he's first coming up. Like, this is when these niggas are first out the box, Method Man. We seen all them start at these motherfucking conventions. Well, um, what was going on at these conventions? Like, was it networking or? Nah, it, it was showcases and networking. Showcases, like, everybody got booths and shit. You know what I mean? Record labels got booths all up in the hallways and shit. Um, the whole hotel, it's like a whole hotel convention. Like the, the, the ballrooms and shit got shows going on all day. People DJing, you got different events and shit going down, but it's a whole hotel event and everybody's in the whole fucking hotel and shit. So yeah, them hallways like downstairs and by the conventions and shit was filled with hella people. But at this one, this is when Death Row is funking with fucking Luke Skywalker and shit. So Death Row was there like a thousand deep. They running through that motherfucker, running it up. You got puffing them, running through that motherfucker. And this is when Dr. Dre made Dre Day and Snoop is going, they all going at Luke. Man, them goddamn Miami, I don't know where Luke people, man. This was in Orlando, Florida, the Jack the Rapper. We are in Orlando, Florida. Them goddamn Miami niggas came through that bitch so 
thick. Tan shit up. I ain't gonna explain the, the you know what I mean, the, the, the real details. Only real niggas that was at that Jack the Rapper know exactly what the fuck happened. <laughs> but it was, it was bad, you know what I mean? It was all bad. Just know that Death Row and Luke Skywalker is funkin' at this time. And this is the factions that's going at it, why? Yeah, so shit gets shut down. Fucking, uh, 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 fucking, uh, what the shit called? I don't know what SWAT. the squads, the SWAT team, SWAT team come through. They come through the hallways with helmets and shields and shit. They gas and shit like it's bananas. Like so, it was a big brawl. So there was the, so this whole convention is at this hotel. Yeah. And there's all types of people from all different record labels. Yes. And on top of that, you got Death Row, which is a hundred deep, and Luke is hundreds deep. Luke wasn't supposed to be there. Mm. Death Row and Bad Boy and all the other labels, Luke ain't got shit out right now at this time. I don't think he had nothing popping. He just showed up on some wild shit to confront Death Row. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and shit got ugly, man. Period. Shit got ugly, man. Um, It got ugly, man. It got ugly, man. It got fucking ugly to where our record label left us. <laughs> like we still had days left. Our left, nigga, everybody, executives, everybody, like, we're out of here. They bounced. They just left us like, we just here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And did some incident happen with, uh, I ain't gonna even say that, man. That, that... <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Something, something happened, man, to where we is in danger. Let's put it like that. We is in danger. And we telling the label, and they're like, oh shit, you, you, with them people, we're out of here. They, they <laughs> was so scared of the people that we got in trouble with that they flew. That was the main thing. Like, we had nothing to do with the Luke and them shit, but. Did, you, did that, you see the whole fight and everything between them? Nah, hell nah. That, it shit got shut down. Like, we trying to go to the event. So, I guess Death Row had a, had a showcase. So, we're all walking down the hallway trying to go to the event and shit to start going down. Everybody's running the opposite way. So, we got to run. Everybody's running and shit and getting trampled and shit. Like, so, yeah. But it went down on their showcase. You know, Luke and them popped up thick. Mm. And start, you know. Yeah, so Going that shit it. got shut down. SWAT team came through that motherfucker, you know, keeping people in their hotel rooms, hella shit. Executives and shit, everybody was gone the next day. We still had like two, three more days left. We was there. Yeah, man, so. Oh, so you stayed even after your security we left? We still had to stay. Security, the label, everybody left. We still there, we still there promoting <laughs> okay. this shit, man. Everybody got little. They like, we ain't dealing with this shit. <laughs> yeah, this death row fucking Luke Skywalker shit. No, we ain't dealing with this shit, so that shut the party down, period. Convention down. But I think that plant the seed with Puff, you know what I mean? Because we met Puff and Big, you know, back then, you know what I mean? So us to be on tour with them mm -hmm. a year later, this is 94. So we on tour with them the following year. It was literally the following year. This is like summer of 94. By summer of 95, we on tour with them. Okay, is that where you guys met? That's where we met. The first time we met Puff, it's on Rhyme and Reason. Rhyme and Reason had the cameras and shit out there. You see me and them out there. I had the walk aware shit on, the little bandana. Yeah. It's Puff been a was while out there. Since, it's been a while since I've seen Puff it. Puff was out there, no shirt on and shit, and you know what I mean? Doing his Puff. <laughs> no shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Wilder, man. They had the, uh, the Craig Mac. That's when Craig and Big was coming. They had the Big Mac package. They had the Big Mac, but they had Craig Mac on the Big Mac box. Yeah, that was okay. a promotional kit. So they had the Craig Mac, Big Mac boxes going through. Red Man had some promotional shit that was crazy because he was coming with uh, his first album. So he had the he was the baby. He had the little baby cartoon, the beanie. He had his little pro promo shit going down. Method Man had his promo shit going down. All the West Coast artists, all the East Coast men, everybody was there. Everybody. Every fucking body was there. I seen people in their beginning fucking stages. Literally, like, everybody. Everybody. Stellar event. Stellar event. It got ended by some drama. And yeah, them, them, type of, um, them type of events, man, be the ultimate networking. You know what I mean? Like, when you want to get added on the radio, when you want to get played on MTV, BT, uh, whatever the shit was, you had to, like, go to them type of events and 
elbow, rub elbows, and hopefully you'll meet an executive at BET or MTV that like your shit or, you know what I mean, a promoter that like your shit and put you on tour and shit like that or whatever, or a DJ that like your shit, put you on a mixtape. So yeah, it was it was networking, definitely at its finest with the, with, the, with the biggest of the biggest. You know, we all trying to come up in this shit, so yeah. I've been one, at one of them conventions with Destiny Child, Destiny Child, when they first was coming up. You know what I mean? Mm. Beyonce and them, they, they had to run that circuit too. Like everybody had to run that just to blow their name up. You gotta be at these conventions performing and shit. They got showcases, so that got your name out there. So yeah, I just seen Beyonce and them at that shit. You know what I mean? Period. It start, everybody had to do them to come up. That's how you networked and met the DJs and a lot of different people from different cities and everybody different flying. artists tours. I mean, that's how you said, I think, that's probably what led to your that's tour. That's how you get there. Yeah, it did lead to our tour, period. But the connections, like you said, like DJs flying in from everywhere, radio stations, you know what I mean, flying in from everywhere. You want to get added to these top, you know what I mean, top 100, top 40, you know what I mean, radio stations that's, you know what I mean, playing these songs. So you got to go up there and do a dope-ass performance. Now, these top... You know what I mean? Radio stations see you like, oh, not only is the song dope, they get down. I'm going to play this more. You know what I mean? So it's just, you know what I mean? Promoting and networking. You know what I mean? Basically. So, yeah, th those was much needed. I don't know where they at now. We need those again, period. Because a lot of people network at parties. And I don't think a party is, is a good place to network because you can't hear somebody talking with the music playing. You know what I mean? But if you're in them hallways without no music playing, you know what I mean? You could talk and hear each other. You know what I mean? You got a desk or bull for something. You could, you know, put your dismount on full tens. You know what I mean? Instead of, hey, 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 boom, boom, doom, doom. hey, hey, oh, my name is like, it, it, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to talk in, in the club. So you need more network events like that to where people c can connect and people can learn this shit because a lot of um, the new era, you know what I mean? As far as the streaming shit, a lot of people don't know the game. A lot of people don't know exactly the, uh, the the percentages you're supposed to make, the money you're supposed to make. As far as YouTube, we still up in the loop with that. You know what I mean? Like, a, a, I don't want a penny per, I don't know what the fuck it is, but I know you gotta sell, 50, you gotta do 1,500 streams or something with one motherfucker to be one sale. I know that. Mm. So, 1,500 streams on a single for to be one sale, one record sale, so. Mm. Nobody knows the breakdown of the shit that they doing right now. Period. You gotta do 1,500 streams to be considered one fuck, of the whole album, to be considered one album sold. How the fuck and what the fuck? Mm. So you need these, yeah, you need these type of conventions to bust that shit down to give you the knowledge. They got, you know what I mean, people that's up there talking and give you that type of knowledge and the, the um, the business of the shit. We all can make music. We all can make, you need to know the business of this shit to make money. We do this shit to make money. If you don't know how you're making money, why are you doing this shit? So that is needed. Them, them conventions are needed, definitely, because they bust that bitch down. You'll get a somebody from a, a top record label, Universal or fucking Atlantic or something, getting up there, give you the blueprint. Somebody from YouTube, like, hey, this is the breakdown, man. Woo, 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 woo. And you do a million, we gonna move and bust all that shit down so you to, oh, I get it. Instead of guessing, I'm gonna keep on throwing shit in and whatever my check is, is what it is. But you don't know because you don't know. Like, if you know what it is, you can say, I did this, 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 it's gonna add up to this. My check should be that. Instead of guessing, like, oh, they just gave me a check and I hope it's that. No, you know, like, okay, I did this and I know exactly what they say I get. Now I could divvy it up and I know what's coming. Okay, probably some taxes got took off a little bit off, but boom, or they percentage got took off a little bit off, but I got it. You got to know what you're getting paid or they could cheat you. Real shit, man. It's, uh, that's crazy. Yeah, they need to definitely need something for business or something. But those conventions have that. Not only with you networking with the music side of the game, they have people giving you the game. You know what I mean? So those are needed. I noticed that the Loonies haven't did any shows in a while. Um, well, <laughs> is there a reason for that? or? No, nah, we have been doing shows, but um, we've been missing a, um, a, 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 we've been missing a, um, a member. 
Um, as of now, me and Num really ain't seeing eye to eye business wise. You know what I mean? He don't like how I handle business. I don't like how he handled business. So right now, we really not fucking with each other as far as doing shows. You know what I mean? We already connected at the hip as um, far as, you know, what we did in the past. But um, it was a long time, you know what I mean? Like of separation. You know what I mean? We grew up together. We was struggling together. You know what I mean? Like literally like from junior high school on up. So um, that type of vibe, you know what I mean? Where you could finish each other's sentences and shit like that, that's gone. You know what I mean? Um, you know, um, five on the pop, you know, we start working on the second album and we split up, you know what I mean? Like he got his own crew, I got my own crew. We start hanging with different people and that slowly, you know, just start putting us apart. So I got my solo deal with rap a lot. And that really like, you know, put us apart, you know what I mean, straight up. So um, that, um, uh, some things can't be fixed. You know what I mean? You grow apart, you, you start hanging with new people. Um, yeah, but that'll always be my brother for life, man. Period. Straight up. Um, I wish him nothing but the best, you know what I mean? And maybe later on in life we'll be able to get it together, but the best groups, it's hard to keep together. You know what I mean? We done seen funk with the best of them. You know what I mean? Like N.W.A., Wu-Tang, like the list goes on and on the best groups and, and it's all with dealing with different personalities, de dealing di with different egos, dealing with different attitudes. And um, yeah, you know what I mean? Sometimes shit ain't, is unmanageable. You know what I mean? And when it's just you two. So there's no way you guys are gonna be doing shows together? Um, I don't know. I mean, if it could be done like how Fife Dog and um, Q-Tip did it, you know, they weren't seeing eye to eye, you know, before Fife Dog died, rest in peace of Fife, but they had to have separate hotels, separate dressing rooms and shit like that. So if we could do something like that, I wouldn't mind. Like, just put me somewhere totally different. I ain't got to see him until we get on, on stage. Yep, that'd be dope. And I assume he probably feel the same way about me. Wow, you know? that bad, huh? Nah, it ain't fighting bad, you know what I mean? I could be in the same room with him, but um, what I just prefer, prefer to be separate, you know what I mean? Like, cause you know, he got his crew, I got my crew. My crew is different from how his crew run, you know what I mean? Like me being from the projects, me being from the bill, you'll think I have the rowdy, you know what I mean? The, the side that's just tearing shit up and rowdy, but unfortunately it's not that, you know what I mean? It's the rowdy side on him. And, you know, I know not to bring, you know what I mean, certain people. I could bring a lot, but I can't bring these certain motherfuckers. I, I know what they do. I know what they're about. You know what I mean? I know if I bring this certain motherfucker, everybody getting robbed. You know, if I bring this certain motherfucker, somebody gonna get shot. So I know what to do and what not to do. He haven't figured that out yet and he brings everybody and shit get fucked up, you know what I mean, period. So if it's gonna be like that, I want him to have his own separate thing and I have my own separate thing. So when some do get fucked up, it will be on the, the right side and set up as a whole, you know what I mean? Because that's a lot of, uh, like, the, 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 the biggie thing. I didn't come on stage with the liquor. Somebody from his crew came on stage with the liquor. Mm. Got us kicked off the Biggie Smalls tour. You know what I mean? Um, I had to deal with a, a case that I'd have nothing to do with. I had to pay 50 grand for him and his crew. But we're the loonies. We're getting sued, not his crew. 50,000 for some shit I didn't have to pay. Go to jail, everything. Mm. Court, all types of shit. For something I ain't even do. So when it comes to shit like that, and I'm the motherfucker from the projects, and I'm sparing you from that. I'm not bringing my project niggas around to do the shit that your supposed to be good homies is doing. It, it, it's, it's, it's a glitch in the matrix, you know what I mean? Like, come on, nigga, we, we here to make money, let's make money, and let's, let's make the brand right. Let's not have no fuck ups. Let's, let's keep the brand pure. Let's not do no side sucker shit, no underhand shit. Let's not be stealing and, and people dressing room, drinking up their liquor and the shit that they got on their rider when yo, 
Like, your crew is drinking people's shit, like, in their dressing room. But they're supposed to be in our dressing room. What they doing in the next artist's dressing room, drinking up their rider and eating their rider? That's, mm. that's not the move. And I'm the nigga from the projects. You're not from the projects. And my nigga's not doing that. So how the fuck I'm going to let you do it? And be cool with it and keep getting us kicked off of the biggest shit ever. Getting kicked off. And just accept it? La, 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 la. Like, no. 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 If you want to fuck up, fuck up by yourself. You ain't going to fuck up the loony's name, the brand, none of that shit. Period. Like, you, you seen this interview? I create this shit in Juvenile Hall. Period. So, like, come on, my nigga. Don't, don't play with me like that. I gave you your name. You was a skinny one. I called you numbskull. You took the name. Mm -hmm. Like, Man. come on, my nigga, give me respect. It's like it's no, it's like I'm the enemy. You know, like the dudes he hang with, he treats them with more respect than me. The dude that he's making millions of dollars with, I don't get that. It's like, fuck you, but love the motherfucker that just fucking up and ain't did shit for you. But f fuck the dude that's doing everything together to make this shit happen, to get us both paid. Fuck him. So <clears throat> until he could get over that, it, it will never be us two, you know, to doing our thing together. You know what I mean? It's him. He need to make a decision. I'm, I've been a team player. I made this shit as a team. So once he be able to figure out how to be a team player again instead of, you know, making it more about niggas that ain't got shit to do with us, then we could get back on point. But as long as it's about that, shit, man, hang with them, <laughs> you know? If you, we made millions, my nigga. I don't know what you're making with them. But if you want to hang with them, hang with them, my nigga. But they ain't going to fuck our business up and fuck our opportunity up, fuck the brand up. I'm not letting it happen. Not on my watch. So until, you know, he can straighten himself out and get himself business-wise. business, business wise. We're not teenagers, my nigga. We ain't got to invite every nigga that we know to these big events. We ain't got to wait at the motherfucking security trying to get... A thousand niggas in when we go on in five minutes. And then you cut into 10 minutes of the show because you so worried about getting niggas in the front door that ain't got shit to do with the show. Don't you got a crew? Mm -hmm. Why don't you leave somebody out there and get them in and you come to the stage? Because we got to go on in five minutes. But instead, you got to be out there and we're cut 10 minutes of our show now at the big 30,000, 40,000 people is there waiting for us. The DJ got to spend some shit because the loonies is not on stage at stage time. Mm. So instead of doing a, a 15 minute set, we do one song. Is that good with the with Live Nation? Al Heyman, all these type of, is that good with them? Is that good business? If they pay you for a 15 minute show and you only do five minutes, mm. worried about getting some niggas in? That ain't got shit to do with the show. Mm. So when shit happened like that, it's like, eh, you do you, I'm going to do me. So he's doing shows. I'm doing shows, you know. But mm. separate. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> but separate, man. He's doing his own thing. I can't deal with the sloppiness. Sorry about that. You got a podcast. Yeah, definitely, man. Uh, Smoke a Lot Radio, a few podcasts, man. But uh, the big one is Smoke a Lot Radio. We are part of uh, Digital, Soul, Digital Soul Box Network. Uh, Watch Pod TV, you know what I mean? So we got some big shit going down. But, um, yeah, we've been doing this shit for a minute, man. Uh, Smoke a Lot Radio started in 2010. We was on Blog Talk. when motherfuckers had to call up and dial up. In uh, 2014, we uh, uh, did a deal with Be Real TV, so we was over there for two years. You know what I mean? And um, after that, you know what I mean? We got with this little soapbox. You know what I mean? I've been doing our thing with them ever since. So, yeah, that's been our move, man. And um, the podcast shit, man. Um, we basically been doing the, um, the radio shit. You know what I mean? Fuck the podcast shit. Um, let's take it back to the DVDs. You know, we was doing United Ghettos and shit like in nine, uh, 2001, 2000, 2002. So I had the camera and I'm 
walking around with the camera everywhere, all the events, all the traveling and shit, and I'm behind the camera, and I'm interviewing people behind the camera. And that's how you got United Girls, Volume 1, Volume 2, mm -hmm. Eye Candy, all the shit. You know, Mac Dre, my homie, started doing DVDs right after that, Trill TV and all the shit he was doing. So we made our own little wave in the Bay Area with independent DVD. You know what I mean, period, along with the, the top dogs, you know what I mean, the doggy diamonds that was doing all the DVDs back in the day. Smack, when he had the raps on DVDs before the YouTube shit and, you know, uh, the, the, whatever they got going on right now, but it all came from the DVD era. So I was doing DVDs first, you know what I mean, period, interviewing artists, you know what I mean? So I've been had a passion for the shit, you know what I mean, not just because it's you know, the wave, everybody got a podcast. I've been interviewing artists. You got, you could go get all my DVDs right now. You know how to get those one through three. I'm interviewing everybody, you know what I mean, behind the camera. So that's been my passion, you know what I mean, just behind the camera. And um, just trying to give um, the uh, insight, you know what I mean, to behind the scenes. Like, I don't want the normal interview of an artist. I want a motherfucking artist to be telling me about, yo, we gonna go through your neighborhood, we gonna talk about where you was raised up, you know what I mean? Like the real shit that you don't give the average motherfucker on your interview. So I was pressing the, the, the I was pressing the line back then, you know what I mean, period. And it influenced a lot of people. Uh, shout out to Hood to Hood DVD, Legendary. Yeah, you know I mean? They definitely, you know what I mean, um, was rocking with, in the circle, we was all in the same circle. Mac Dre, me, Hood to Hood, we was all in the same circle at the same time doing DVDs. So, Do you have a favorite interview? Uh, Mac Dre, <laughs> duh. <laughs> Mac Dre, man. Uh, <clears throat> is it out? Yeah, it's United Girls Volume One. So, no, um, I mean, is is it on YouTube? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So um, they, they, they didn't cut the shit up. United Girls all over this motherfucker. So uh, United Girls Volume 1, we do the whole um, Mac Dre interview. Then right after that, we go into the little hyphy, Ghost Ride the Whip type of scene. And that, that was a movement. Like that part of the DVD was felt to where you had um, uh, Free Big Meech, but you had um, people out there in Atlanta, you know what I mean, with Mac Dre and, and, uh, and um, and uh, 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 Sh uh, Sugar Wolf, you know what I mean? Um, not Sugar Wolf, um, was it? Yeah, Sugar Wolf, Sugar Wolf. Mac Dre and Sugar Wolf was doing a thiz dance and shit, boom, and then it led to everybody doing thiz dance and everybody in the Bay Area. That thiz dance <clears throat> clip, and it got clips with Mac Dre and them dancing at the compound and shit, that clip is so monumental. Like, it, it just influenced everybody. That was like the, the, the shit that made the DVD go viral, so. Mac Dre, that was the dopest interview, period. That's what made United Ghettos go viral. Made everybody tap in with United Ghettos when Mac Dre was on that motherfucker. Him and uh, goddamn Sugar Wolf, when they was doing their thing up there in Detroit, I mean, uh, Denver, and they was dancing and shit, boom, and everybody, you got the motherfucking something terrible in there going crazy, you got, nigga, it, the whole chop up that we did with that, as far as the editing was bananas. You got footage from uh, E-40, Mustard and Mayonnaise video shoot, all spilled through that bitch. So yeah, just the, just the footage that I had, you know what I mean, and was able to chop up with that interview was dope. So Mac Dre, definitely. Do you have any stories hanging out with Mac Dre? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> That's my guy guy. You know what I mean? That was one of my best friends. It ain't, it ain't like Tupac where I met him, you know what I mean? Nah, me and Dre is like this. You know what I mean? We, yeah. Is there anything you can share? Um, funny or gangster? Like, what, what what type of story you want? Either or. Both. <laughs> I'm down to hear them both. <laughs> All right, man, let me think of a wild one, man. Think of a wild one. With, oh, United Ghettos, man, shit. A wild, funny one was, uh, when uh, Bart from Three Times Crazy and uh, Dre was having a, a roast session. I caught all this shit on camera. They roasting the shit out of each other, man. Like, killing each other. Like, before murdering each other. Like, they said, <laughs> I got all this shit on camera. <laughs> now, Bart from Three Times Crazy is a funny motherfucker, man. So yeah, he, he was giving it to Dre, told Dre he had the extra medium pants on. He had the skinny jeans before skinny jeans was popular. So and he said he had extra mediums, like it's just legendary moments and shit like that. But um, Dre, um, 
I'm gonna give y'all some game, man. Um, Dre, right after Flavor Flav did his thing, Dre was lined up to get the next uh, reality show out here. So he was coming out here to LA a lot. You know what I mean? Tapping in with me, my cousin, old hella people. So he was tapping in with my cousin KB so much that he'd leave his car at the condo and switch cars with my cousin and shit and take my cousin's car and my cousin would take his car and shit. So um, it was real family with Dre, man. Like real family. Like Dre was a, a, a dude that was not only funny and cool as shit and, you know, the dances and shit, but he made sure all his niggas was right. Like, Dre would do a show, and he's getting the money. Bust that bitch down to everybody. Some terrible, all, everybody getting a cut. He made sure every, he'd go to the mall, he buying everybody outfits, not just him. He's that type of dude that would just take care of the, the, the whole, uh, the whole movement, the whole Thiz movement, you know what I mean? He just made sure them niggas had, you know what I mean? And that's what I admired about him, like a dude that didn't have a fucking, a hay bone in his body. You know, a lot of these rappers nowadays, they, oh, fuck that nigga, I'm better than that. Oh, fuck this nigga, I do that. Like, Dre was the opposite. Dre wanted to find them niggas, you know what I mean, the dopest niggas. Put them on, like, man, I need woo-woo, I need woo-woo. Oh, woo-woo was dope. Bring them over here, we gonna do this shit together. So he was with more of getting all the dopest motherfuckers and we mob together and said, oh, fuck that nigga, I'm the best. Fuck him, I'm the best. He was the first one to, to literally bring all types of factions of the Bay, Sacramento, Vallejo, Richmond, Oakland, Frisco, EPA, like all factions of the most dangerous parts of fucking the Bay Area in Northern Cali together as one. When niggas was funking and shootouts and shootouts with each other and shit and couldn't be in the same building, he brought us all to fucking gather mm -hmm. to get money and no hate. He saluted everybody. He like, nigga, yuck up. The cold motherfucker, nigga. Three times crazy, cold motherfuckers. The mob figures, jack of hus, them some cold motherfuckers, man. He never was like, I'm better than them. I could fuck them. Like, no, nah. he like, them niggas dope. I want to fuck with them. Period. And that's what's missing in rap right now. Period. Like, motherfuckers that really appreciate dope artists and just want to rock with them. Instead of being hate, so much competition, so much funk, so much, ah, oh, fuck that nigga. Ah, oh, that nigga a bitch. Ah, oh, that nigga, like, Dre wasn't that. It was the nucleus, the, the glue, that I mean, that, that made a lot of shit happen, man. So, whew, okay. Dre, Dre, Dre definitely gonna be missed, man, period. Yeah, for sure, for sure. The, the, the second nigga that did it like Dre was uh, the Jacker. And the Jacker, three, we was all together doing that movement. So Jacker seen the blueprint of Mac Dre. And when Dre, you know what I mean, went to, you know what I mean, to um to heaven. You know, of course, Jacka just, just just kept the torch lit. You know what I mean, period. So, yeah, Dre and Jacka. You know what I mean, definitely. What happened between you and Faison? That wasn't nothing. That, that shit ain't nothing, man. Me and Faison, um, I ain't got no issues with that dude. Um, it was some shit that he said about MC8. Uh. Mm-hmm. I don't know, I think he had mentioned me or something, threw me up under there. And I responded, you know what I mean? I was like, yo, I'm not with the the internet shit, boy. Um, I'm just trying to be cool with this shit, you know what I mean? Because we really from the streets. He's from the streets, you know what I mean? I'm from the streets. So I'm like, yo, instead of being so negative, let's, let's teach these kids how we came up. You know what I mean? How did you turn, stop being a, a dope dealer and you became a rapper? How you stopped being a gangbang, you became a comedian? So I'm like, instead of hitting these kids with these these negative shits, like, yo, we made it, my nigga. Like, we don't need to be promoting violence and shit if we ain't in them streets. If we ain't still in them streets and we all in this Hollywood shit and we living good, like, why are we promoting street violence? And why are we talking about street politics? So. That's the thing that I was saying with him, like, bro, we ain't in the streets no more, my nigga. Why are we talking about these street politics? Let's teach motherfuckers how to get out the streets, you know? And I was just pertaining to the MCA situation. They said, allegedly, you know, some 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 false shit. Oh, I don't know if it's, you know, but to me it was false because if you ain't got no paperwork, it's false. I can't read a autobiography, a, a biography, a, Oh, is that when them snitch allegations memoir. were going yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, they said he was a snitch. You know, um... And this came from a memoir, a book. Uh, 
okay, you know what's crazy is um somebody posted what was supposed to be the paperwork of this case that they were talking about, and I read through it and I didn't see his name on the paperwork. But it's a testimony. It's a testimony. So everybody nowadays say if you testify, you snitch. But yeah. Yeah, Either yeah. way, that's a, uh, okay. So, so it was a testimony, and it was about, I guess an individual got indicted, and it was a testimony about him working on a movie with that individual. So it's no, nothing to do with crime, nothing to do with uh, uh, getting somebody arrested for crime. This is a legal movie. Lisa Ray, everybody's in it. He's talking about the movie. He's talking about what he got paid to do the movie. That's it. He don't know nothing what this individual got going on behind the scenes. He just got flew out to Chicago to do a movie. That's what the testimony is about. That testimony did not get that in individual extra time or nothing. It was just a testimony about what I got paid to do in Chicago. That's it. So people use that snitch word hella lightly. Like even, you know what I mean? I ain't gonna even go there, but they said it about me, but where's the paperwork? You gotta have paper. Who got arrested? Who got arrested for what eight said? Who got arrested? But it's easy to just throw that word out there, like, oh, he was in court, oh, he got it, like, no, you got that, like, people die. I'm from the projects. You gotta have real fucking paperwork to even say that S word or that R word. You gotta show and prove, or your noodles is gonna be on your lap, period. You can't play with that. You can't put false snitch jackets on niggas. That's not that. Niggas will, sp I'll fuck you over. Your family will have a headache over that. In the real streets, this industry shit where you can get on YouTube and shit, hey, he's a rat, he's a... Nigga, you haven't been on the block lately. You in your house in the Beverly Hills or wherever you at, nigga, you ain't on these streets, boy. You can't say that as loosely. You with your mom somewhere behind a computer, you can't say that loosely in these fucking streets unless it's really proven fact. So. That's all I was saying on that whole situation. Like, that wasn't a proven fact. And instead of promoting that stupid shit, let's promote us getting out the neighborhood. And that's all I was saying to Faison. I ain't got no problem with Faison. You know, um, he got his own opinion about anybody. But unless it's facts, let's put out some facts, man. Let's not, you know. And that's the thing about this black culture, period. It's like we hate on each other so fucking much. It's like... Other races do shit every day. We don't talk about nothing that they do. Nothing unless they beef. Oh, Machine Gun Kelly, Eminem, they got some rhymes against each other. But other than that, we ain't talking about shit they do. But every fucking thing your brother or your sister do is magnified. Oh, this motherfucker did. Oh, that's a, oh look at it. Everybody. Let's stop hating each other so much. Period. Like... It's way more other races doing shit. It's way more other people doing bigger shit than we doing in rap. It's way more people with way more money than this nigga and that nigga that you focused on and hating. Like, stop looking at people money. Stop counting pockets. Stop, like, that creates hate. Quit counting niggas' pockets. Quit being worried about what somebody else is making. Worry about what you making. And if not, use that as motivation like oh if he could do it I could do it that's it oh shit they made that much money shit well let me start something it's oh fuck that nigga he ain't from the hood that nigga's a bitch oh he gay oh he's a sucker oh he's a love, love, love. he got robbed oh he's a snitch oh, like whoa but you don't say this about no fucking other race why they run it up together they all together everybody together Making money, buying property, buying Bitcoin, buying businesses, all this shit, and we over here like this. Fuck yeah, fuck yeah, fuck yeah, fuck yeah. We ain't gonna never win, period. So I just want us to get over the black on black hate and the black on black crime. Once we be able to get over that, we gotta have black on black excellence. They say black excellence for a handful of motherfuckers that's in the Forbes. What about the rest? You know what I mean? We got to have real black excellence is to take it back to, you know what I mean? Um, black Wall Street. You know what I mean? Oklahoma, Tulsa, that's black excellence. 
you know, to take it back to black excellence is um, Black Panthers, you know, protecting us, you know what I mean? Shit like that. Um, right now, we don't got nobody protecting the inner city youth, you know what I mean, or paying for the inner city youth to have breakfast programs, lunch programs, you know what I mean, um, Pop Warner, all this shit. Like, they look at the Black Panthers like they were some people just with guns. No. They were feeding, homing people, like homeless shelters, all the shit. They were taking care of the community on all levels, not just protection. So we need more of that. People that, as far as the black community, man, I, I don't know about nobody else. Y'all ain't getting shot on television. If y'all do, they don't show it because they ain't promoting that. But anything happened to a black person, they putting that shit on television. Boom, black person uh, uh, jaywalked and got shot. Black person did this, high speed chase, got shot. Black person hopped the fence, got shot. Black person put his hands up, got shot. Black person did this, got shot. Like they pumping that shit for a reason. They don't show no other, you ain't never seen an Asian nigga get shot by the police. If they have, they ain't put it on the eyewitness news. You see a Mexican motherfucker having a high speed chase. That's it, you don't see him get shot, killed. But every fucking day a new black child, a new black kid, a new black, uh, new black woman, new black man getting killed, slid, all types of shit, and it's the normal. So, when you promote something so much, it's like people become desensitized to it. You know what I mean? Like, you desensitized, desensitized to seeing a black man die. But if it's your race, you're like, oh my fucking God! But you ain't see it. You ain't see it yet. They're not gonna put that on television because they paint the black man as the big bad wolf, the big gorilla, we're the big, we're bigger, stronger, we got basketball, we're big, we, we do all that, we're intelligent, we're gonna kill them, we're black, we're ugly, we're, uh. And the news and the media spread that. You know what I mean? And then that's where it got all eyes on black people. Oh, people grabbing their purses and shit. Old lady grabbing their purse when they see a black person. It's pumped by the media. Police always want to shoot a black person, but a white motherfucker, no disrespect, but a white motherfucker out waving his gun. Motherfucker, come, leave, you, leave me alone, you motherfucker. I wouldn't. Please put it down, put it down, sir, put it down. This motherfucker waving a gun at everybody. Put it down, sir, got a knife, waving it. Hey, I know judo, I know karate, get away from me. Put it down, sir, please, please put it down. You had a shootout with two white kids on some Grand Theft Auto shit. They broke into a motherfucking house and they found two, they found guns, ammunition, they had a shootout with the police. A white female child got killed by the police and the other white child came out with his hands up. We heard about that shit for one day. Nobody said nothing about, hey, the white kids are, are being influenced by video games or the white kids are, you know what I mean, terrorizing and shooting schools up and shit. None of that. It's one day. It's one fucking day. What they do. But it make us look like we're the motherfuckers that's going shooting up schools, shooting up churches, shooting up government, raiding capitals and shit. We don't do that. But on the news, you see it? Oh, the black guy's the enemy. The black guy's doing this, that, doing that, and the third. With that being said, we need to unify and stop hating on each other because as long as we hate on each other, everybody else gonna hate. They got the free pass, period. They got the free pass, nigga. Y'all kill each other, so... We could kill y'all too. Y'all don't give a fuck about y'all killing each other, so why should we give a fuck? So, but that being said, we need to strengthen. We need to fucking hold ourselves down. Like the Asians hold themselves down. They got a Chinatown, they're a fucking city in America. Like, come on, my nigga, the, the Indians are held down. They got ranches and all types of motherfucking uh, 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 casinos and shit and properties everywhere. Like, everybody's Jewish people got shit everywhere. The black people ain't got shit but hip hop and sports. We're just entertainment. That's it. We could be entertainment. We can't do nothing else. But everybody else could, could make big ass moves in Chinatown over here and little this over here and this over here. And I like, come on, man. Black people need to unify and stop falling for the fucking banana in the tailpipe, period. But be unified, we strong. That we start supporting each other, we strong. The more we against each other, Nick Pitting and, and shitting on each other. <clears throat> the more everybody else win off our shit and we ain't even winning, man. So black people need to wake up, you know what I mean? I hate to go into that big old soliloquy, but shit like the, the phase on love shit should have never happened, period. That should have came from somebody else, not, not, not your own race, not somebody else trying to down somebody like 
the fuck? Like, people don't know how hard it is to get into this shit, bro. It's not no overnight shit. Like, whatever, like, like shout out uh, Kwa uh, Kwame Brown. They call him a bus. He was number one pick out of high school. Got the most money, money, period. Like, that takes skill. You know what I mean? You're on this game, you're on that team, but they, oh, he got, somebody said one rumor. The, the fucking ESPN, whatever. It's, oh, he's a bust. He was garbage. The teams didn't Steve, think that. Them, Stephen A. Smith. Yeah, the, them teams for years. Yeah. Stephen A. Smith ain't played a lick of ball. So, the white guy gets caught smoking marijuana, and Stephen A. is joking about, oh, don't smoke the weed, weed, hey, you could have did any. The black chick get caught. But he goes hard. So it's a different type of attitude Stephen A. have towards different athletes. Black, he's going to go all in, period. Any other athlete, he chills like, well, this is a warning, and this guy didn't know he was out partying. You know, you party, you have fun, you drink a beer, you probably hit a little marijuana, and he just didn't know the circumstances of his, uh, you know, you know, his abilities. He know that he wasn't, and he's defending this motherfucker with his heart and soul, but let a motherfucking black person do it. He was a bust. He was smoking too much weed. That's why he was a bust. He never came to play the game. I play the game. Like, he just, like, is real emotional over black fuck-ups. And then when it happens with, like, let's be real. Like, the, the, the fucking quarterback of the Steelers, we don't hear it. He did his thing, accusations. What's his name? Ro uh, Rosenberg? Uh, yeah, Ben Roethlisberger. Rosenberger. He got uh, accused. Not convicted. Accused. Of the R word. I'm not going to disrespect y'all. The R word. Continue to play basketball. I mean, football. Had a great career. Retired. Nothing else was said. He got accused of rape? I didn't know that. Man, dip it, dip it, man. Pull, 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 pull your shit up. I believe you. It wasn't no smoking or no DUI. He got accused of rape. Mm, this must have been a long time ago. How long no, ago? no, 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 no. It, it was a long time ago, but it wasn't promoted like that. But let um, the guy from the Eagles fight some dogs. Oh, Michael Vick. Michael Vick. Let Michael Vick fight some dogs. Couple dogs die, he goes to jail for two years, lose all his shit. Dude, didn't lose nothing. He got accused of rape. Then lose shit. So, with that being said, they could do it. And the shit gets swept under the rug. They could do crime. They talk about it one day on ESPN. Hey, man, this person got caught. And they never say it again. And they don't be disrespectful with the shit, too. They be extra kind. Oh, well, you know, that's the, that's the lingo. Everybody pop pills. You know, but they pop Molly. But then they get on Bill Cosby and say that he's a drugger and he drug bitches and shit, knowing that back in his days when people were partying in the disco area and shit, that was a sex revolution. People were having sex in the bathroom, on the grass, nigga, in the park, everywhere. It was a sexual revolution with no condoms. And people was on mushrooms, nigga, uh, fucking quaaludes, quilu, fucking cocaine, marijuana, everything. You know what I mean? Period. That was they. It was the fucking hippie era, hippie disco era. So everybody that fucking chose to take a motherfucking mushroom or motherfucking quaalude or something, they got raped. Let's be real with this shit, my nigga. You see this? Mm -hmm. Boom. I just poured you a cup. Do you want it or not? No, I'm cool. Okay, cool. So you could decide not to take the cup or take the cup. Or you could say, hey, do you have a cup? And I could do the same shit. I do have a cup. Here you go. And you're going to say, you want this. Uh, there you go. No, I'm good. <laughs> but look, you can say, I got a cup. And you can say, I want a cup. And you give it to him. Like, boom. Okay. Yeah. Did I drug this motherfucker to ask for it? Or did I just give it to him because he asked me for something? Or she asked me for something? So you, so... Are you saying that he was taking drugs and in the midst of him taking drugs? Somebody said, where is that? And he's like, oh shit, I got him here. Mm. 
It's like a drink. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like you got the bottle, of, uh, the whole bottle, and the motherfucker wants you to pull up in the club. Man, pull me a drink. Oh, boom. You got the bottle. At that time, whatever they was doing was the bottle. Yeah, you could do it. Yeah, bitches, we is popping. Did he rape somebody? That's the question. My nigga, the whole shit is if everybody in Vegas is off Molly and cocaine, then they got that shit in the club, and I take a bitch up to my room, and I fuck her. Did I rape her because she's off Molly and cocaine that she got at the club downstairs? And we both agreed to go upstairs and we fucked? I'm a celebrity, so she come back 20 years or 30 years later and said, I got raped that night and he gave me this and he put this in my drink? But this is Vegas. Y'all all popping Molly. Y'all up all night, nigga. Y'all popping, y'all snorting coke. Y'all smoking weed. So a bitch from nowadays that's doing all of that could come in 2050 and say little Uzi Vert or somebody raped her because they was all off the party drugs and having fun and the menage a trois. And she, just because she ain't the girlfriend, she felt like, oh, I ain't the nigga girlfriend. He ain't spent no money on me. She want to say that he raped her. It, you, you, you was that doped up for 50 years that you didn't know? And you just woke up out of 50 years like, God damn, I was raped. Bullshit. Cosby was trying to buy CBS or NBC, trying to do what they do. When you try to level up, you get took out the game. They gonna either fuck, it, fuck your name up, your brand up, to make no sponsors, nobody fuck with you ever again. And if they can't do that, then they gonna arrest you. And if they can't arrest you, then yeah. I assume you two, Van Halen, um, fucking Mick Jagger, um, all the country country singers, Dolly Parton, all them, I assume they have all their masters right now. They done figured out how to acquire their masters and not be a slave to the record label. They're still alive. Um, once we figure out the game and try to start our own shit, all of a sudden our people just vanish. Vanish. Mike is out of here. Mike figured the game out. They try to say same shit, rapists, all that dumb shit, but never convicted. It's like they're going to make some fake ass tabloids about you. Mike was fucking the baddest bitches in life. The nigga took Brooke Shields to the Grammys like, what are you saying? And a monkey. Like, what are you saying? Like, the most money motherfuckers could ever imagine. But what Mike Go Jackson didn't have was a childhood. So... What do you do when you get money and you don't and you ain't doing something that you, you know what I mean? Now you got money, you could do it. Okay, he never had a childhood. Okay, of course I'm gonna buy some fucking fucking amusement park swings, fucking giraffes and shit. I never was around a zoo, I never went to an amusement park, I'm buy all that shit in the backyard. What these rappers do now that never been in the neighborhood, they wanna be the Biggest, baddest gangster. I want to be with the guns and shit, all this shit. But they never been around that growing up. So when you get your money, you do shit that you couldn't do. Them niggas were squares. Now all of a sudden they can hang with gangbangers and get protection. And now I'm flagging, I'm doing this. The same with these rap niggas that never was a gangbanger growing up in their fucking life. Now they're the top blood of crit right now. Same with Mike. He never had a childhood. I wanted to have child shit in my motherfucking state. And not only that, I want to hang with some children and fucking be kids. I want to drink apple juice and shit or whatever the kids do. And that's what he fucked up and, you know what I mean, everybody made it a problem with him not having a childhood. So you can't just put that on Mike. Mike had the baddest bitches, you know what I mean, period. Mike was a real motherfucker, you know what I mean. And they're going to put them, 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 they're going to hit you with the tabloids. They control the media. Bill Cosby raped somebody 50 years ago. Fuck out of here, man. All these bitches coming out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Bitches got paid to come out. Talk about that. I don't even know. Who know these bitches? Where they all come from? Are they real? Are they true? Are they, do they even know this man? You can have a random bitch. Hey, I met him at the phone. I don't know you. Who the fuck is you? So, you had actors in there. Acting and saying false shit. 
If it was real, he would have got arrested when it happened. If it happened. That's bullshit. When you try to do what they do, level up. I mean, own your own shit. And everybody be on this shit like black people. We need to own our own shit. They're not letting us. They're not fucking letting us own our own shit, bro. Period. They're not. They're not. You want to go do this? Then you want to have your own distribution company, nigga? They shut Jay Prince, Suge Knight, and fucking Irv Gotti down. I was there. I was on rap a lot when that was happening. Niggas got hit by the feds. The letter people. They bring them people in. They bring the feds in and shut your shit down. Once you try to do what they doing, mm. My, Jay Prince, none of them niggas ain't no drug dealers and kingpins, but they came through with the feds and try to act like they selling. They selling records. Nobody got arrested, mm. so it's bullshit. But it let people know, don't try that again, or we gonna keep coming at you like this. Mike, you own all the publishing, half the publishing at Sony. Never again. They wiped Mike out. Allegedly, the doctor was hired. Who was paying for that doctor? Prince. Where the fuck he at? Leveled up. He had slave shit. We slave. We are slaves to these industry. Until you able to do your own motherfucking Universal or own Atlantic, you are a fucking slave to these motherfuckers. You're working. The new motherfucking cotton... Is entertainment. We still working. So when Kanye said we a slave and Prince said we a slave, they were right. We still fucking picking cotton. And they don't want to let us own our own motherfucking cotton field. Our own Black Wall Street where we could do our own shit, pick cotton and get our own money. No, pick cotton for us, make us billions and trillions of fucking dollars, and we'll get the fuck on. We'll give you some trinklets, some nigga trinklets, some little chains and shit, some little cars and shit. But get on. You're not going to do what we do. You will never be a universal. You will never be a motherfucking Atlantic. You will never be a version. None of that shit. If we got some, if we, you will never be a CBS. You will never be an NBC. You will never be none of that shit. Leave it up to them. So every time we try to level up, they take us out and take us down, man. It's, it's, it's not, it's not even. Especially when an Asian motherfucker could get a Chinatown in any motherfucking state in America. As soon as we try to level up, we get shut down. It's hella Chinatowns. They ain't came with bombs and planes and all types of fires and a racial war like Black Wall Street was over fucking Chinatown. Chinatown, New York, Frisco, L.A., every fucking major city. Nobody had a Chinatown war for that shit. Mad at China selling Chinese food and karate and doing their culture? We let them have their culture. Why? We can't have our fucking culture. Like, let's be real. Music is our culture. We made this shit what it is today. That's why rap is number one. Not country. Not rock and roll. Not none of that shit. Because the truth will always set you free. You can fake it all the fuck you want, man. All that shit came from us. Rock and roll. Country. Pop, R&B, blues, riz, all that shit came from us. All rip-offs. We didn't do the Marachi shit. We didn't do none of that. But that shit they doing in America, it was at the motherfucking slave plantations. We doing the blues. We doing jazz. All that shit at the juke joints and shit. We doing this at the plantation. Why we slaves? All that shit that they made up, gumbo and shit, we made that. That's the shit they gave us to us. To make, we had to make gumbos and shit like that. The shit y'all like. We made that shit famous because they gave us bullshit. Bacon and shit. We had to make that fly because they gave us bullshit. They gave us a fucking bullshit pig. So we had to make the best out the pig. Now y'all eating bacon and shit. We made that shit pop. Mm. They didn't give us a chicken and none of that shit. Hey, come on, man. So at the end of the day, bro, when you when you look at the demographic with every other race in fucking America, and it's only in America because other fucking countries look at us like we, what the fuck is going on? You go to Europe, they got a black Madonna, my nigga. Mm. A black Mary, statues everywhere with a black Jesus. This is in the Vatican, my nigga. 
They know the real. But in America, what they teaching us? American culture is just American. Everybody in the world ain't going down with this bullshit. They looking at us like we clowns. And that we are, we ain't even get the full knowledge. They like, nigga, they ain't teach y'all this. They ain't teach y'all that. They ain't say this. Like, whoa. We know that. So, it's teaching us to go against each other. That, like, crabs in a bucket. When it's really the elites and the tops. It's playing this shit like motherfucking puppet masters. Mm. And they had they fucking trillionaire, billionaire fortresses and shit. While all these little motherfucking ants is on the ground. Fighting. Killing each other. Not doing business, fucked up business. Everything is fucking each other up. They up here at the top of the motherfucking mountain. And we can't even start a mountain to get up there. We so busy consumed with what you're doing. Worry about the top. Look at the top. You can't get to the top unless you look. You mm. can't be focused on who's next to you or behind you or in front of you. Top. That's how you get to the top. Period. I don't give a fuck who's on the side of me, but we so worried about who's on the side, who's on the front, who's on... No. Top. We don't care about nothing that's going on. Top. That's how you all get to the top. Tunnel vision. You don't worry about what the next man doing. Or unless you using it as motivation. Somebody that's at the top. That's why I say look at the top. Get motivated and do what they do. You know what yeah. I mean? Try to level up a different way to where you don't get eliminated. You know what I mean? Period. Like, I know a lot of people get on this motherfucker. You know what I mean? And um, just don't want to talk about the reality of America, man. America is, is, is the home of the free, the home of the brave. We get a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, freedoms that uh, other countries won't allow you to do. But at the same time, it's a lot of shit that they do in other countries for other people that they don't do in America, man. Like, everybody keeps saying, like, hey, let's get reparations. I want some money, 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 reparations, money, money, money. Money is a digit right now. That's a computer digit, my nigga. It ain't even worth, it ain't backed by gold no more. Money used to be backed by gold, my nigga. It ain't backed by gold, so it's a piece of paper with a digit on it, my nigga. That only makes sense in America. You take that same ass piece of paper somewhere else, that shit ain't gonna, ain't gonna do what it do. You try to transfer that shit to some euro, nigga, you'll get half your money or a quarter of your money back. Period. In euro. So, American dollar only makes sense in America. Probably in Mexico, you probably double up or something. Puerto Rico, you know what I mean? Some shit double up. Dominican, you know what I mean? Third world. But well, you know, the dollar, the dollar else, is the world currency. Hmm? The dollar is the world currency. American dollar. Yeah. Yeah. So what? They, all the oil gets traded with dollars. So what? I don't care. You go to Europe, and that American dollar is low, lower than the euro. True. So that's what I'm saying. Like you'll go to Japan, and it's lower than the yen. You'll have to like pay three times the American dollar for the yen that you want. So American dollar ain't popping. That shit losing value every fucking day. That's why they doing shit like current uh, cryptocurrency, bitcoins and shit. Shit that's holding its value. The dollar is being eliminated. Period. That American dollar ain't worth shit but out here. Straight up. So at the end of the day, with that being said, we are so focused on shit that don't even, it's not even worth nothing. We're killing each other over shit that's not worth nothing. You go outside, take some vacations overseas, get them ta get the passport stamped. And you try to the basic 10,000, 15,000, you can take it Turks and Caicos, nigga. Go to Japan for that same motherfucking weekend and with that 10, 15,000 and see what you get in yen back. 10, 15,000 Americans. See what, how much yen you get back. And you'll be like, what the fuck? It's not... A, not half, not nothing. It's like, what the fuck did I just trade my money for? That's showing that, that the American dollar ain't shit. So quit worrying about that, man. You know what I mean? Worry about businesses. You know what I mean? Um, shit that... I mean, fuck the businesses and shit. That too. But as far as the reparations, I, I lost myself because I was drinking at uh, Bellevue. Shout out to uh, Rick Ross, man. Shout out that Bel Air. But um, yeah, man. Um, Reparations. Everybody like, reparations, 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 reparations. Boom, boom, boom. They want money, right? I need a hundred thousand. I need two hundred. I need a million. Fuck all that. 
Get back to the original purpose of reparations. Where's our fucking land? We need that land, man. Land is worth more than money, my nigga. I need my 40 acres. And I need my motherfucking donkey. My mule. Period. That's it. Leave me the fuck alone. We got money. Give me my land. Land is worth more than this useless ass dollars. I don't give a fuck. That's why I was making a point that American dollars ain't worth shit. Because you can't spend it nowhere else but in America. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So, give us our land. We want the 40 acres, man. Fuck. Everybody keep on forgetting. Like, we just promised 40 acres and a mule. Not money. And everybody's like, I want money, I want money, I want money. Give me 40 acres. Period. Well, I think we'll wrap it up with that, man. You know? Straight up, man. Um, that was... Yeah, so, I was deep. I went yeah, uh deep rant right there. Yeah, 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 man. You know, I, my thing they call me Yuck Mouth, but my uh my, my my nickname is Sharif, so I just went on Sharif Sharif rant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just went on Sharif rant, but I mean, you want you want your entertainers to be, you know, what I mean, to talk more about shit like this, you know, what I mean, because they look at us, you know, what I mean, that the kids they 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 look at us, they we supposed to be role models, now. Everybody being a role model can't be the nigga that's just rocking the ice, getting the bitches and shit. Give us some game with that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Give us some game with that. And, and that's all I'm trying to do is give game. You know what I mean? Every time I can. You know what I mean? Now, this is just my opinions. Disclaimer. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer. This is my opinions. You know what I mean? Don't go out there and be like, Young Santa's in this fact. This is my opinion. This is an outsider looking in, man. So it's more deeper than rap, man. But just me looking at, you know what I mean, looking at the situation, man, I just see that we can't win if we're not together. Mm. You know what I mean? We can't win unless we're together, man. All the self-hate, self-crime shit, you know what I mean, um, ain't gonna win, period. We're gonna still stay in a position we've been in since, you know, slavery. And it's gonna continue unless we finally unify and support each other. So, black people out there, man, um... I know you got a lot of uh, multi-millionaires, billionaires and shit out there. You know, a lot of people successful and shit. But um, let's make everybody like that. You know what I mean? Let's let's get everybody up on that level. Let's unify. Let's stop hating on each other, man. Um, just know that you're special, man. You know what I mean? Just know that you're special. And we're going to end it on that. <laughs> Appreciate you, bro. Straight up.